Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on developing carbon capture and storage projects in Alberta. I'm Christina Stave, Senior Client Engagement Lead with the Global CCS Institute, and I'll be hosting the event today. And I'll be joined by several of my colleagues at the, at the Institute who will be helping me moderate the sessions today. A few brief webinar reminders for everyone. This webinar is being recorded and the copy of the webinar along with the available slides will be posted on our website following the webinar. For the sessions that have a question and answer time, please type your questions into the Q&A box on the Zoom platform. And just a reminder that you can change your view of the webinar um, by using the view toggle on the upper right hand corner. So we have with us today an outstanding group of speakers from government and industry that will be sharing their perspectives on developing CCS projects in Alberta and Canada. And Alberta has been, for decades, an important part of the global energy picture. And going forward, Alberta will remain a critical part of our global energy system throughout the energy transition. The Institute started planning this webinar earlier this year to showcase the amazing CCS ecosystem in Alberta. And since then, there have been many significant CCS-related announcements, as well as policies proposed that impact the development of CCS projects. In summary, it's an exciting time in Alberta, and we, are, we have a great agenda for you today. So here's an overview of our agenda today, and we'll put this agenda slide up repeatedly to, to show you um, how we're going to progress today. These times are, are suggested, um, and they may slip a little bit, but this is what we have planned for today. So following my introductory comments, we're first gonna hear from policy and government speakers. And then we have sessions with industry players on both existing projects and future possibilities. Let me first provide some background on the Global CCS Institute for those of you who might not be familiar with us. The Institute is an international nonprofit climate change think tank, and we have a mission to accelerate the global deployment of carbon capture and storage projects. We have more than 100 diverse members and our membership includes businesses, governments, and NGOs. And our global footprint allows us to support our mission and our members. We focus on advocacy, intelligence, and communications, undertaking activities that, the, that support the deployment of CCS projects. The Institute is focused on the global deployment of CCS because we believe that we need carbon capture and storage at scale to meet the challenges of addressing the massive volumes of CO2 that need to either be prevented from entering or removed from the atmosphere to have a meaningful impact on climate change. Just a little bit of background on why we believe CCS is needed at scale. Many of you are probably familiar with the UN IPCC's 2018 special report on global warming of one and a half degrees Celsius. And the report highlighted the importance of reaching net zero emissions by mid-century to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of CO2. The CCS is part of several of the IPCC scenarios for reaching this mid-century net zero milestone. So currently we're capturing and storing 40 million tons of CO2 per year. The magnitude of CCS implicit in the IPCC report is somewhere between a total of 350 and 1200 billion tons of CO2 that needs to be captured and stored by the end of the century or 2100. So the annual amount of CO2 captured and stored must increase by at least 100 fold by 2050 to more than 5 billion tons a year. So it's this need to increase CO2 capture and storage in order to meet, to meet the net zero milestone that's creating the urgency around the acceleration of the deployment of CCS right now. The figure on the right of this slide was developed from the IEA Sustainable Development Scenario, and it gives you an example as to how a scale up of CCS could look by fuel and by sector. So in the context of this scenario, about 1.7 billion tons per year of CO2 could be captured from coal, another 1.7 from natural gas, and another billion each from industrial sources and from biomass. So in summary, given our current global energy and industrial emissions landscape, it's imperative that CCS be deployed on a large scale to meet our collective CO2 mitigation goals. And as we'll hear today, CCS technology is widely applicable to many ind industries to mitigate CO2 emissions at scale. And it's an important technology for modifying our existing energy and, and industrial systems to enable them to produce fuels and products with lower carbon footprints. 
The Institute closely tracks the development and operation of CCS networks and projects around the world. And this figure here is from the Institute's Global Status of CCS Report 2020. What one can see is that Alberta is a leader in CCS project deployment. And given the recent momentum and CCS policy and project announcements, this will only continue to grow. So for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Corey Shannon. Um, Corey is the International Director of Climate Change Policy Solutions for the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. And he's gonna set the stage for us and talk about CCS as part of a vision in a low carbon economy. Corey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Christina. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Corey Shan. I'm a, a, been a long serving Boilermaker for 34 years. I'm a welder by trade. And uh, the Boilermakers have been around since 1880 and we've worked in all these industrial facilities throughout North America, um, Canada, United States. And we also build and maintain both of our nation's respective naval fleets. So we're very much involved with the energy industry in all its facets and, and from the oil and gas sector to the nuclear industry to uh, power generation, um, the list goes on and on and on. Nonetheless, um, I'd like to thank you, Christina and the entire team at the Global CCS Institute for the opportunity to share a few words and thoughts on the progress of accelerating the deployment of carbon capture technology. Thank you to all the vast industrial facilities for all the risks that you've taken to build a better world that provides for good paying jobs that support the economy, create energy stability and energy security. Please know that the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers stand with you against the real villain, which is carbon dioxide. It's been said that carbon capture needs to be woven into the tapestry of progress for our modern world and for the future of a low carbon economy. The world's brightest scientists have documented that unless we apply carbon capture technology to control greenhouse gas emissions in a variety of industries, this will face dramatic changes or challenges as a result of climate change. In fact, there is no other technology that will mitigate greenhouse gas emissions like carbon capture technology. The reality is, is that we need to adopt every solution available if we're to keep the planet a hospitable place to live. And carbon capture technology will play a vital role as the only solution to mitigate the emissions created from the production and manufacturing of in all industries, including those of renewable energy sources. It's the only solution that will make it possible to scale up energy, renewable energy sources and other alternative energy sources without destroying our economy and social stability. We're collectively building strategic alliances with like-minded individuals, organizations and government to work collaboratively to amplify our message and the importance of carbon capture and its role for a cleaner energy future. It's time that we all begin to work together to support and preserve well-paid meaningful jobs and promote technologies that will mitigate these greenhouse gas emissions. This is the win-win story that needs to be told for a stable economy and the collective fight against climate change. I would like to thank the Alberta government for its leadership and its staunch support for our energy industry and also your intense, intense support for the adoption of carbon capture technology. We've had so much promising news of alliances and collaborative efforts and talks of hub clusters being built in this province. And we also would like to thank the federal government for now, in which we are involved with the 90 day consultation period for a tax credit that we hope will accelerate the deployment of carbon capture technology. Also recently, the federal government of Canada created a website for CCUS for carbon capture. I think this and the collaborative effort that the Alberta government and Canada's federal government are showing is truly, truly setting the stage to be the global leader 
which we always promote ourselves to be when it comes to energy growth, but also addressing climate change. As nations go through COVID recovery, what a better place to spark and ignite the investment than in the energy industry and adopting innovative technology like carbon capture to stabilize the economy. The Boilermakers look forward to being part of the solution and working together with all of these groups to accelerate the deployment of carbon capture technology to stabilize our economy, preserve jobs, grow jobs, so we can all talk about the win-win story for our children and grandchildren in the future. I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity, for these sharing a few words with everyone. And if you'd also like to see the passion that the Boilermaker shares with the world we created, which I believe is in all likelihood the first advocacy and promotional video for carbon capture technology, you can see this at www.cleanerfuturecs.org. And also, if you need to reach out to me to have any discussions about the Boilermaker's position and what we intend on doing uh, for further advocacy, on emission reduction technologies, I will be available and you can reach uh, me concluding this uh, brief presentation. I know Christina will, will share my contact information, but you can also um, get it directly from the Global CCS Institute. And I will always be here to, to discuss this and, and work together on a path forward to move this economy forward and be part of the low carbon future low carbon economy future that we were all looking forward to participating in. And thank you again. And I wish everyone uh, good health and hope to see everyone soon as we get past the uh, restrictions from, from COVID. And thank you again. Hi, Corey. Thank you. And thanks for your insights on the role of CCS. Much appreciated. Um, if anyone would like to reach out to Corey, we're going to flash his contact details up here for a minute and do that. Here we go. One more slide down. Yeah, there we go. Great. Thanks again, Corey. So great to hear from you. So following that great perspective from Corey, I'd like to hand it over to Matt Bright, the Institute's Senior Advisor for Advocacy and Communications to introduce and moderate our next session. Matt? Matt, you're muted. Hi, Matt. Um, I think we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio. We can't hear you speaking right now. Are you muted? Yeah, unfortunately, we can't, we can't hear you speaking. Um, well, how about, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Well, Matt, we'll, how about this? We'll let these guys um, kick off their presentations and then we'll bring you back on after, okay? And you can give us your intro comments then. <laughs> so Drew, um, you're first up. Why don't you um, start with your presentation on policies impacting CCS in Canada, Alberta? Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'd like to thank the Institute for hosting this event and for having the chance to speak about some of the federal perspectives on CCUS as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, the government of Canada has set a target of net zero GHG emissions by 2050. 
And in that context, um, CCUS will be needed to mitigate emissions in our hard to decarbonize sectors and industries like oil and gas, cement, fertilizers, chemicals, iron, steel, et cetera. It'll also be uh, key to enable other low carbon pathways such as hydrogen and will be essential to delivering negative emissions down the road. And you're going to hear me today talk about CCUS because from our perspective, we can't forget that you. Uh, to slightly modify Corey's point from earlier, CO2 in the atmosphere is the villain, but CO2 itself can actually be quite useful, as I'm sure you know. Um, and compared to five years ago, there's much more recognition today that CCUS is an essential set of technologies that will play a critical role across a range of applications. Any modeling I think you look at uh, bears that out. And under any energy pathway, CCUS projects in Alberta would be needed to meet Canada's ambitious 2030 emissions goals, and even more so for the um, contributions needed to reach net zero. The good news is that Alberta already has the right building blocks in place to develop its world beating CCUS leadership, including the geology, the technical capacity, policies, regulations, and infrastructure like the trunk line, which you'll hear about more later. Uh, the federal government for its part can play an important role in addressing hurdles to CCUS technology development and deployment, um, obviously complemented by efforts from provincial and territorial governments, the private sector and academia. As I show here on the first slide, uh, Canada has a vibrant CCUS ecosystem with a number of projects, players, and programming expertise. As a country, we've been advancing CCUS since the late 1980s, uh, before we were even calling it CCS. And these efforts have accumulated, uh, culminated in a exceptional uh, CCUS abilities, including world-class labs, testing facilities, scientific and engineering expertise, leading innovators, um, analogous oil and gas sector competencies and funding programs to drive technology development and deployment. Over those years, uh, NRCAN has worked with Alberta on some great examples of CCUS innovation, whether it's Quest or ACTL, but also uh, it includes the Alberta Carbon Conversion Technology Center, where the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize named Carbon Cure a grand winner and Calgary based Carbon Upcycling won an X-Factor prize. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Um, what I would say is that Canada is taking an all of the above approach for CCUS. We recognize it'll require a mix of tech push and market pull approaches to achieve broad-based deployment. And as the IEA advises, a blend of policy tools is needed to support a market for CCUS, including things like RD&D, capital and operating support, regulatory requirements, tax measures, public procurement of low carbon products, and technology neutral measures. Um, for its part, Canada has recently introduced a number of cross-cutting measures that will enable CCUS. These include uh, national carbon pricing, rising gradually to $170 a tonne by 2030, a proposed federal clean fuel regulation, which is expected to create CCUS related compliance credits by 2030, and proposed legislation, uh, well, nearly finished legislation, enshrining a net zero emission target for 2050 and a strengthened national target of 40 to 45% uh, reductions from 2005 to 2030. Uh, Canada's experience to date shows that a range of federal and provincial policies have helped a first wave of CCUS projects to materialize, including public private funding arrangements, GHG regs, uh, provincial legal and regulatory frameworks for CCUS projects, which I know Justin can likely speak to further in an Alberta context. We do know that the policy and the techno-economic findings from the first wave of projects are extremely valuable, not just to us here in Canada, but to the world. And I look forward to hearing from Jeff and Stephen in the following portion about some of the lessons learned from these projects. Canada's overall policy and program toolkit will be laid out in the upcoming comprehensive CCUS strategy, which was signaled in our Strength and Climate Plan last December. This strategy will establish a vision and a set of recommended federal actions to accelerate the CCUS industry in Canada and to realize our GHG reduction in commercial potential. We expect this strategy to be finalized in the fall of 2021 in advance of COP26. I wanna spend a couple minutes just to talk about what the recent federal budget meant for CCUS. It announced the creation um, of an investment tax credit uh, to come into effect in 2022 
for capital invested in CCUS projects with the goal of reducing emissions by at least 15 megatons of CO2 annually. This proposed investment tax credit would generate tax credits for capital invested in CCUS projects. And this type of incentive is based on the cost of capital equipment purchased for a project rather than on the annual amount of CO2 stored as you might see in something like a 45Q style measure. Um, Finance Canada, my partner department in Ottawa, is in the process of conducting a 90-day consultation period with stakeholders on the design of that credit. And after it ends, uh, so after September 7th, Finance Canada will announce more details, including the rate of the credit. Um, tax policy is the responsibility exclusively of Finance Canada, but I know they have cast a really wide net across sectors for this ongoing consultation. And I would really encourage any interested parties to actively engage in that engagement process. The federal budget also announced $320 million for my department, Natural Resources Canada, to support research development and demonstrations to improve the commercial viability of CCUS technologies. We wanna use that resource to fund, or sorry, to push the envelope on CCUS technologies, lower the cost, including for capture, and to ensure that Canada stays ahead of the global curve in this space. Further details about this program will be rolled out in the coming months, but under any scenario, we know that we'll be working with funding partners, including in Alberta, to help amplify the impact of NRCAN's investments. The budget also highlighted Alberta's near-term potential to become a global leader in CCUS through the development of CCUS hubs. And on that note, I look forward to hearing about the prospects of hub development in Alberta from OGCI and others later today. Lastly, on top of the $3 billion that had been previously announced, the federal budget also proposed an additional $5 billion for the Strategic Innovation Fund's Net Zero Accelerator. This will help to support projects that will expedite decarbonization of heavy industry, scale up clean technology, and accelerate Canada's industrial transformation. Beyond the budget itself, uh, the Strength and Climate Plan also included a hydrogen strategy and a $1.5 billion fuels fund, which could also support CCUS solutions like the production of blue hydrogen. Canada's Infrastructure Bank, along with Infrastructure Canada, is working on a strategic plan for CCUS and low carbon fuels as an explicit priority for their investments. And Canada's Clean Resource Innovation Network, or CRIN, received Government of Canada, uh, Canada's $100 million investment last fall to develop uh, clean tech and emissions lowering solutions such as CCUS. And of course, I look forward to hearing updates about this from Joy uh, in the later panel. Finally, to help Canadian companies navigate the various federal programs that are at play when it comes to CCUS and other clean tech, the Clean Growth Hub was established as a no wrong door focal point for clean technology innovators and adopters. As I'm sure you'll hear from both Justin and I, well, different aspects of CCUS may fall within the purview of different levels of government. There is ample room for collaboration. For example, the annual Energy and Mines Ministers Conference allows NRCAN to work with provinces and territories on shared interest of interest, such as the CCUS strategy. And in March, uh, NRCAN and Alberta ministers jointly announced the establishment of the Canada-Alberta CCUS Working Group it builds on over 20 years of CCUS collaboration. It also underlines what is ultimately our shared focus, which is enabling a ramp up of large scale CCUS project in Alberta this decade and beyond. I think that's probably a good spot to pause and to hand things over to my colleague, Justin. Thanks very much. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, beautiful. I put on a red tie today, uh, just in, in honor of Canada matches the flag. So um, anyway, very pleased to have Justin Wheeler now. Uh, Justin is the Executive Director for Climate Implementation and Compliance um, at the Alberta Environment and Parks Department. Um, so Justin now has this presentation. Uh, we'd like to remind folks to please uh, ask questions. We're seeing a couple roll in, but use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, and so I uh, would like to make this as useful as possible. With that, we'll let Justin take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me now? Okay. Awesome. Um, 
thanks Drew for the intro and, and, and Matt, and also thanks to Corey and Christina for setting the stage for this. Really excited to talk to you today about the CCS opportunity in, in Alberta specifically. Um, so maybe just before I jump into explaining this, this graph, uh, just a quick intro. So my name is Justin Wheeler, ED of Climate Implementation and Compliance. Um, so within the government of Alberta, CCUS is very much a joint responsibility between my department and Department of Energy. So I'll, I'll try to speak to both and I'll punt all the hard questions over to my energy colleagues to follow up later. Um, within my purview, uh, so my team runs Alberta's technology innovation and emission reduction system, which is Alberta's industrial carbon pricing system, covers over six, about 60% of our provincial emissions. And that includes a emissions offset system, as well as a tier fund. So technology innovation mission reduction tier is the acronym we use. Um, so the fund is used to reinvest the proceeds of that, that pricing system into accelerating innovation and deployment of, of climate solutions. In addition to the carbon pricing system, which is the core of Alberta's uh, climate management, we also have uh, very strong methane regulations, uh, renewables and energy efficiency programming and, and supports in government. So similar to what Drew was saying, we take a, all of the above approach to tackling the climate challenge in, in Alberta. Um, so this slide is kind of shows why do we talk about CCUS in, in Alberta. This is, these bubbles represent any facility in Canada that has over 10,000 tons of CO2 emissions, CO2E emissions per year. So you can see a huge concentration of industrial facilities in the province of Alberta and it happens to overlay with significant CCUS uh, capacity on the geology side. So this, this arose naturally. Alberta is blessed with many uh, amazing resources, including oil and gas and coal and forestry and agriculture and a very strong industrial manufacturing sector. Um, so these dots represent a combination of oil and gas, electricity, petrochemical, refinery, fertilizer, cement and other facilities in the province. Um, just for a sense of scale, so those, these bubbles are scaled by the size of emissions. The largest bubbles that you see on the map are about 10 million tons per year of CO2e. Um, so Alberta is among the global leaders in CCUS already. We've taken considerable steps on commercial scale funding. We were an early investor in the, in the technology given its strategic importance to the province. Um, we have a regulatory system in place. We have ongoing regulatory enhancements and a, a vibrant knowledge sharing system for the projects that we've funded to date. Um, so Alberta obviously is the, the province on the western side of the graph there with all the, all the dots for those of you that aren't familiar with the map of Canada. Um, so our combination of geology, science, innovation, uh, and business know-how give our province a unique opportunity when it comes to CCUS. I'll skip to the next slide. So in terms of business needs, um, we feel that we, we check the boxes on all of the, the fundamentals required to attract and deploy large scale investment in CCS over the coming decades. Um, so we've been able to demonstrate that the business needs are in place by having commercial CCS and CCS projects that are already operating and have paved the way. Uh, so we have the physical aspects and infrastructure and we have the secure geology for, for uh, CCS. So Alberta's carbon sequestration capacity is estimated at at least 20 billion tons. So 20 to 30 billion tons of saline storage alone. And then if you include other storage opportunities like depleted oil and gas reserves, like the North American CCUS Atlas does, uh, then that goes up to 80, 80 billion tons of uh, CO2 storage capacity. So that's well over a hundred years of current emissions levels, not to mention all the other uh, emissions reductions that are on the way. So it, this is core to both our decarbonization as well as our, our clean growth priorities going forward. Uh, we have an operating CO2 pipeline, which Jeff is going to talk more about later. Um, currently, about a, a million and a half tons of CO2 per year are flowing through that pipeline. But importantly, we invested in upsizing or oversizing the pipeline. So it has over 14 million tons of capacity and, and it's fully operational. So ready for people to invest and connect to today. Uh, we also have the Quest project, which uh, you'll hear a little bit more about too. Um, and that's demonstrating 
secure storage in, in deep sea alien aquifers of, again, over a million tons per year. Um, and then Drew already mentioned we have the Alberta Carbon Conversion Technology Center, so that's enabling the testing and development of, of innovative CO2 utilization technologies at one of the power plants in Alberta. So Alberta has has specialists um, in terms of our workforce with experience and know how to engineer, procure, construct, manage, manufacture, and operate the complex, highly technical projects and facilities that that would be needed for CCUS deployment. The technical expertise for CO2 capture and delivery has been demonstrated and, and is very aligned with our existing workforce skills in the oil and gas sector, um, where we've been developing hydrocarbons and doing enhanced hydrocarbon recovery for, for decades or approaching a century now. Um, the, the highly trained workforce also has robust safety training and worker compensation and other systems in place to be able to hit the ground running on, on these large scale projects. Next slide. In terms of the regulatory system, we also feel like we have the, the fundamentals in place there. So we have an industrial carbon pricing system that's been in place since 2007. It was the first in North America. I'll say a couple more words about that on the, on the next slide. We have the GHG reporting and reduction requirements now under tier. Um, Canada's clean fuel standard or clean fuel regulation is coming, which Drew mentioned, and that, that dovetails very nicely with the accounting systems and crediting systems that we've built under the tier system. And then from business essentials, uh, we've already developed and proven these business essentials with commercial projects in operations. Uh, so poor space, we've clarified that poor space is owned by the Crown in right of Alberta. Uh, there's a process for those rights um, for dedicated CO2 storage and uh, projects. And there's also a, a liability transfer and a, a, a fund for the long-term liability. That's all administered by my colleagues in the Department of Energy. Um, and they've also just, in order to ensure that this poor space, poor space is accessible and allocated in an efficient manner and enables the development of hubs, uh, the Department of Energy has recently released its information letter on a process to to optimize the development of those hubs and is currently consulting on that. So if, if folks have questions, I can say a few more words about that. We also have the carbon offset system, the emissions offset system. So again, that's, that's under tier and that lays out the exact accounting for translating uh, the tons of CO2 that are captured into emissions reductions that are then credits that can be sold to facilities to meet their meet their compliance obligations under the tier system. And we've invested significantly in both the development and deployment of CCS technologies. So we've committed over $1.2 billion to the, the Quest and ACTL projects, the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. We've also invested through, through ERA in significant technology and innovation. Um, so over $200 million has been invested in CCUS related projects there, and that's significantly leveraged. So at least two to one and often more like four or six to one uh, in attracting private investment in, in that innovation. Next slide. So just a couple more words about the, the tier system, the regulation and the emissions offsets. Um, so every large emitter has to count for all its emissions on site. If it sends CO2 offsite in a pipeline, that's included in its in its regulatory calculations for emissions. Once that CO2 is securely sequestered, um, then a credit is generated that can be used against compliance obligations. So that does a couple of important things. It it leverages the carbon price to to add value to CCUS projects. It lays out a clear accounting mechanism, which includes third-party verification. Um, and it, it lays out the point of, of crediting and calculates both not just the CO2 that's being sequestered, but the net, the net emissions reductions associated with that CO2 sequestration. So accounting for things like any leaks that would happen along the way or any energy use associated with this, the CO2 capture and sequestration activities. Um, and that accounting system enables both the import and export. So it's, it's set up to be scalable to a kind of integrated CO2 system that would cross a number of 
of large emitters and, and integrated sequestration systems. Um, so all the fundamentals are there to, to credit the CCUS activities, and that's already being used for the, the projects that exist in Alberta. Next slide. So as we, as we look ahead, there's a couple of key priorities that this aligns with. Um, so both Alberta and Canada have, have significant focus on uh, clean hydrogen development. Alberta has a natural gas strategy published, which includes a very strong uh, focus on clean hydrogen, which in Alberta means primarily natural gas to hydrogen with, with CCUS integrated into those projects, also known as, as blue hydrogen. And, and we are globally competitive as one of the lowest cost places in the world for producing low emissions or emissions free hydrogen. And, and we're already doing that. The CO2 capture projects that are in place in Alberta are both associated with, with hydrogen manufacturing facilities. Uh, so the, there's a hydrogen roadmap that's currently under development and that aligns closely with the hydrogen strategy that's uh, been published by, by Canada. And we're working closely with Canada on the implementation of that as, as Drew mentioned. And then we've also committed to enabling our industries to meet their ESG and net zero goals. And Drew referenced a number of the exciting announcements that have happened recently, which all feature a very strong component of CCUS and, and clean hydrogen in them. So this is central both to the decarbonization and emissions reductions at our existing facilities as well as enabling clean growth and high value utilization of our resources going forward. Um, so maybe just in closing, <laughs> so the last slide is, is very simple, basically says Alberta, Alberta is open for business. We feel like we're one of the best places in the world to, to bring your CCUS project and bring your, your clean industrial, your net zero industrial project. We have pipelines in place, we have the regulations in place we have the skilled workforce uh, that can pull off these large scale projects. So we have all the key building blocks and we've seen a number of exciting announcements recently that are taking advantage of, of exactly these things. Um, we've invested significantly in, in setting the stage for, for these projects and, and we're prepared to partner on a go forward basis to make sure this happens and excited to work with the federal government and particularly thrilled about the supports that were announced in the in the recent budget that align very closely with our, our shared interests in developing these projects and, and seeing significant emissions reductions and clean growth happen in the province. Great, well, thank you, Drew and, and Justin. That's has been a very, very um, interesting, uh, profitable session. Um, so a lot of questions are rolling in, um, so we'll take them mostly from the top, but um, I just wanted to ask a quick general question about, um, you know, you mentioned Justin there at the end that you're looking forward to working with the, the national government. I'm curious to know kind of just the synergies there a little bit more for an international audience, the synergies between uh, the national government of Canada the, the Alberta government and kind of over the past years, how how policies and your perspective regarding CCS um, and priorities to fund or to regulate have changed over the past, say, decade. Um, so if you could just just yeah. help us out a little bit with that. Sure. Great, great question. I'm sure Drew will have a few things to say, too. But it, so Alberta you know, we, we committed big to CCUS, like similar to what Drew was saying, a lot, we, a lot of our scientists and, and the innovation sector has been looking at this for decades. Um, in particular, in 2008, when Alberta released its, one of its climate change strategies that year, there was a very significant commitment to CCUS and, and that led to the commercial scale projects that are now operating in the province. Uh, so we invested significantly, but so did Canada. We've co-invested in those projects. And similarly, on the innovation side, um, Emissions Reduction Alberta, who is one of the main deliveries of, of innovation funding related to emissions reductions in the province. Uh, they have what's called trusted partner agreements in place with a number of, of federal partners, including Sustainable Development Technology Canada and Enercan and others. So you saw on Drew's slide that there's a number of Alberta organizations that were there in the in the logos on the bottom right and ERA is one of those. So I think, you know, while 
there's a lot of things that our, our governments disagree on and have disagreed on over, over the decades. Um, and it's, you know, within any federation, there's always a discussion about who has what powers and, and what the sharing is. I think CCUS has been a strong area of alignment and, and joint support for the past decades. And, and I think we're very well positioned to, to see that on a go forward basis. So we advocated for some of the supports that were in the federal budget. The investment tax credit is something in particular that we think dovetails really well with the existing carbon market and the existing infrastructure that, that is already in place in an Alberta. Um, the strategic innovation fund, the net zero accelerator is also very applicable to Alberta and, and leverages some of the existing innovation programming that we have in place and supports through things like the Alberta Petrochem Incentive Program and, and ERA's uh, funding to those, those things are stackable to then further accelerate deployment of, of CCUS specifically, but, but more generally innovation projects that will lead to, to significant emissions reductions in the, in the province. And maybe just to step back from a high level, like Alberta's, Alberta is a huge part of Canada's inventory. We're, we're responsible for almost 40% of, of the emissions in the country. And the vast majority of that is, is industrial emissions. So the, the pathway to Canada's targets requires partnership with Alberta and requires significant emissions reductions in Alberta. And that's, that's not lost on anyone. That's not lost on our government or our industry. And, and I think we, we have a very fruitful ecosystem set up to, to see the investments that will enable achievement of those targets with ongoing growth and, and economic opportunities for people in Alberta and, and across the country. Great. Drew, do you want to jump in on that? You know, Justin, Justin, you did a pretty great job on answering that one. I think for, for people who are, are truly new to um, Canadian energy politics, it's maybe worth just mentioning in terms of division of powers. Um, Canada is, is a bit unique in the sense that the provinces like Alberta um, have the exclusive um, ownership of the resources themselves, energy and mining and other. Um, and so a lot, most of the regulatory regime is, is done at the provincial level, certainly around pore space and pipeline, in, in province pipelines, where the federal government plays a little bit more are on um, things like international, uh, the, the pipeline running to Weyburn Mydale for the last 20 years, for example, is a federally regulated pipeline because it crosses an international border. Um, but on areas like RD&D, um, on funding of demonstration projects and deployment of projects, that's where we work really closely with Alberta, particularly. Um, Alberta, care, Alberta actually has a lot more heft when it comes to um, energy science, energy R D and D and innovation, than some other provinces, so we really do work closely with them, as as Justin said, on the Alberta Innovates and the, uh, Emissions Reduction Alberta front. And not to mention a lot of other private sector players like Crane and others. So, great, it's great to hear that. Um, so, Drew, uh, follow up question here: um, Are there any existing or planned federal regulatory schemes in Canada for offshore CCS? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, it's a question we haven't really tested yet um, in the sense that we don't have any, currently have any ocean sequestration projects. There, there's a few proposals being kicked around and much like offshore renewables, there's a little bit of ambiguity about how, um, how that would play. I mean, it is federally regulated, the, the, the offshore, the frontier lands of Canada. Um, and we do have kind of default legislation that would probably affect um, how that rolled out, but it, it's a very active conversation right now with places like Br uh, British Columbia about, you know, what would be the appropriate regulatory regime for offshore sequestration. Great. So um, question just about, uh, Justin, you've been talking about stacking uh, tax credits, incentives, that sort of thing. Um, just some, if we could just have some clarity, uh, somebody's asking about the 45Q tax credit, which in the United States is the credit that gives $50 per metric ton of uh, CO2 captured and stored in saline formations, $35 uh, utilized in EOR or other beneficial utilization. I'm just curious about sort of banking um, CCS incentives. Um, you mentioned various things, Justin, in Alberta and you know, investment tax credits, et cetera. Um, can you just clearly explain, I guess, to somebody looking to 
make the financial case um, for CCS projects more of them in Canada and in Alberta specifically, how you would go about getting the most uh, bang for your buck there for capturing and storing CO2. Sure, sure. I'll take a I'll take a crack and I'm sure Drew will have a couple of words too. And, and we're both, I think, engineers trying to speak accountant on, on this one. So I'll probably get a little bit of the lingo wrong. Um, but 45Q is a, my understanding of it is it's very particular to the U.S. tax system, um, so that exact mechanism doesn't necessarily translate that well to the to the Canadian tax system, and that's part of why we advocated and, and worked with Canada and, and are actively engaged in this development of the investment tax credit. Um, we feel like that's that's probably a better fit for the Canadian context. Um, the bulk of the a significant portion of the cost is associated with with the investment in the upfront infrastructure, and that's certainly the the hurdle that we see when companies are considering a, a CCS project. The the thing they have to get over is it's a very significant capital out outlay and and capital raising to initiate a CCS project, and then you have ongoing operating costs. So so we want a system of supports that helps break down some of those barriers to the initial investment, and then ensures the ongoing safe operation of those facilities. So in that sense, the, the Alberta carbon pricing system and our crediting system, which is at the point of sequestration and allows you to, to generate a, a credit that's usable against a compliance obligation, which is that $40 per ton rising to 170 as as Drew mentioned, that dovetails very nicely with the investment tax credit, which can directly help that, that initial investment decision. So it's not directly analogous to 45Q. And I, I I would argue, and, and people, mainly because people argued to me that 45Q is not probably the right tool for Canada. What we should be looking for is a, a competitive level of supports and incentives to unlock the opportunity here. And I, I think we have an opportunity to achieve that with the balance of direct funding through mechanisms like like SIF, the Strategic Innovation Fund, and, and ERA funding and other things, the investment tax credit from, coming from Finance Canada, and then the carbon pricing system and recognition that you can achieve there. Yeah, and maybe, maybe I don't have much to add on that front, but maybe on the specific question of stacking and, and the interaction of various programs, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a major consideration as we design federal programs of like how they interact dovetail with, with provincial and other measures. Um, and I, you know, I can, I'm sure that that will be part of the discussion related to the tax credit, certainly for the program that I'm developing for RD and D it'll be a consideration, and, but you only have to look to recent initiatives like, um, the emissions reduction fund, which was a methane abatement program announced by the federal government over the last year. You know, it, it went, it took great pains actually to work with provinces like Alberta to make sure that the measures that were put in place on the methane side could interact with, complement, and and support the the Alberta equivalent programs. So I think that principle is generally what we keep in mind when we're designing our our programs. Great. Uh, a really practical question here: um, Are guidance documents available for permitting of injection sites, and where can a person find them if they're interested in that? Sure. So that that link slide, which was flashed up, and and I think these slides will be will be posted so people can access them there, or I can copy and paste them into the chat. If you follow that uh, first link there on Alberta Energy, um, you'll see a link to the letter that was circulated on the go forward process for for pore space allocation and and optimization. Um, and there's there was a consultation that was held last week on on that process. They're accepting submissions until the end of this month. Um, so if people want to get in touch, I have a web address or a email address here. I'll put in the chat to. Uh, sorry, it's just carboncapture.energy.gov.ab.ca, but I'll drop that in the chat so people can get more direct information on that process. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we're getting some questions uh, for, for Justin. Drew can chime in as well too, just about pore space. Um, and can you just in general talk more about the pore space tenure process? Um, you know, how can operators get it? Uh, approval for depleted wells licensing? Um, just in general, if you could explain more about the pore space tenure process, because we're getting a lot of interest in that. 
Sure, I'll I'll do my best. Again, as a it, it's more my colleagues in the Department of Energy that that actually implement that system. But um, I guess there's two separate systems. So the the pore space uh, allocation for deep saline aquifers is a separate thing from the oil and gas uh, resource allocation, which would include any uh, sort of CO2 related enhanced oil recovery or even um, CO2 sequestration in in depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So if you're if you're looking more on the oil and gas side and, and looking to dovetail into existing oil and gas uh, projects or combine uh, extraction of of oil and gas with with some CO2, then sorry, <laughs> I got a note that my camera is off, but I, I think it's on because I can see myself. <laughs> As, um, then the Alberta Energy Regulator is the the place to go for that. So they have directors that govern the the approval of, of well operating schemes, and that would include whatever your plans are for CO2 injection. Um, if you're more on the, the straight sequestration in deep sailing aquifers, so that's that's greater than a thousand meters below surface, um, then that's through the Alberta Energy process that, that was outlined, and, and that's the consultation that's wrapping up right now, and, and they're about to launch sort of a competitive process to, to allocate some of that pore space the, the goal of that competitive process, maybe just to step back to sort of my, my comfort zone, which is more the policy side, the goal is we, we want to maximize utilization of the pore space and we want to maximize accessibility of, of the pore space. So we don't want people to be, you know, speculating and then sitting on pore space and, and not having it accessible to, to others that are ready to do uh, capture and sequestration projects. We, we would like to facilitate the, the natural development and investment in, in coordinated hubs um, that would then allow the multiple capture sites to, to dovetail into sort of centralized hubs that would be operating. We don't have a minimum or maximum size on that hub, so I, or kind of a target number. It's, it'll be a market-led process, but it'll be a competitive process to optimize the availability and use of that, that limited pore space. And Maybe I'll just say this is one of those areas like poor space management, which is unambiguously uh, provincial jurisdiction. But I just, you know, from a wearing my policy hat at the federal level, we're I, I'm really personally enthused with where the direction that Alberta's head in in this because, as Justin said, um, we we want to do everything we can to encourage new entrants um, to to reduce the barriers to entry to play in the CCUS game, and and I think things like this. Uh, this proposed um, policy really do, um, you know, open up the possibilities for who can play in the CCUS world, and and it you know it treats poor space for what it is, which is a public good, particularly when you're thinking in it in the context of a net zero or or decarbonization agenda. That's great, perfect. Um, Drew, I'll we'll give Justin a break for a sec. Uh, <laughs> The clean fuel standard question here about um, would a DAC project, direct air capture project that sequesters carbon underground be able to get credits under the clean fuel standard? Um, person's understanding is unclear. Um, what about the final regulations there and for projects that are just storing CO2? Right. Yeah, I, I I have to admit I'm not a I, I'm not a, I wouldn't want to speak to any particular case and how it would be treated by the the regulations and the regulations are currently only draft and out they are out in the public domain, um, but I I know that um, you know compliance credits could be generated for projects that capture combustion emissions from industrial facilities and oil and gas facilities. I, I should know, but I actually don't know the direct answer about how DAC is treated. Um, um, but but it's clear that CCUS is directly, um, they are expecting credits to come from CCUS um, within the next decade. I think they've actually quantified them in the draft regulations um, in terms of what their expectations are. But on the specific question about DAC, um, I if, if someone wanted to reach out to me, I'm sure we could follow up and give them a more direct answer. Great. Okay, perfect. And then um, question for, for both of you. Um, talked about, Justin, you mentioned how Alberta is really suited to um, transitioning workers. You have the skill sets there already um, for the oil and gas industry. 
Um, somebody's asking if you could just provide the names of the federal and Alberta programs that are in place to help displaced oil and gas professionals uh, transition into jobs created by the CCS industry. Are there specific programs? The yeah. Names of so, so for Alberta, we don't have a specific program that that's targeted at that. I mean, a lot of it is just happening organically, and it's I would say it's less of a trans transition of workers, even organizationally. It's it's more of a transition of of business. So we have businesses that operate in the oil and gas space that are now also operating in the in the CCUS space, and and you're going to hear from Candice later, who's who's a great example of that, or or Jeff with with Wolf. So in Alberta, we see it's a highly integrated kind of organic process that's happening right now where it's the existing workforces in their existing jobs almost um, that are just expanding the applicability of those jobs to undertake some of these projects. And, and it's the same on the construction side, you know, building a CCUS capture facility or pipeline is very similar to building other industrial projects, pipelines and, and industrial facilities that, that we have a long history of of deploying, you know, very significant large scale capital projects in Alberta over the last number of decades. Uh, so the, the, the utilization of that is, is different in that it's CO2 instead of, you know, natural gas processing or other things, but the actual pots and pans and connections are, are very similar. So it's, it's a very natural transition. So I guess long way of saying we don't have a particular program targeted at taking a worker from here and retraining for there because there's no retraining required for, for a lot of them. It's, it's using the exact same skills. Got yeah. It. And, and, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say on, on a federal, I, I, there are, there are not any federal programs that are specifically aimed at reskilling or upskilling people towards CCUS careers. I, I like kind of what Justin said, I think um, the way that we, we bring kind of a people centered energy transition um, lens to this is, getting CCUS projects built um, because in doing that you're just you're going to have a number of people who naturally can migrate to that to those projects because of the existing skill sets they have. Got it. And can you talk a little bit more questions here about the hubs and clusters plans? Um, can you can you just address those a little bit more sort of what what exactly is is going to occur with these hubs and clusters? Yeah, so uh, like I assume that's on on the Alberta side. So I mean, we have again, it's it's leveraging what already exists. We already have a highly integrated uh, industrial system, both in what we call the industrial heartland, so that's the Edmonton region, as well as up in the oil sands uh, in northeast Alberta, and in a few other pockets, so the Joffrey area of central Alberta and places. So there's there's a long history of shared resources and infrastructure there, whether it's you know regional hydrogen pipelines or sharing off gas processing or things like that. So what we're what we're trying to do is dovetail on that and and enable the development of integrated uh, CO2 sequestration systems. So the the capture side we would see happening organically by individual investments at those capture facilities because that's where the bulk of it happens. Um, we have a very vibrant pipeline sector with a number of, of very experienced players, both, and they're already connected with most of those industrial facilities. So, so we see a bit of a competitive process happening organically in the market in terms of pipeline connections and, and build out of that, that network. So the, the intervention that the government is doing on the, to enable these hubs to, to emerge is on the poor space side, because that is the the public good that's that's held by the crown in right of Alberta, um, and instead of just having like a, you know, an auction process to allocate the tenure on the resources like we would do on the oil and gas side, we want to enable common access to that to that resource. So the it's a, the consultation that is out right now in the letter that that's up on the website is essentially to set up that process. So it'd be a competitive process. <clears throat> for people to express interest in operating some of those centralized hubs uh, that would develop that pore space to be utilized by by whoever wants to access it um, for kind of a fair fee to cover the operating costs of of that development. Um, so the hub, it's not a it's not a you know full scale central planning of all of our industrial sector because that's that's not the history of Alberta and that's not the industry that we have in place. It's 
the effective and efficient de deployment of the pore space to then dovetail into that in the existing industrial system. And maybe I'll just just very briefly on that that same note. I mean, I know we're going to hear from OGCI soon, but the the geology and the industrial makeup of a particular region or or co complex is is going to decide where these hubs make most sense. Um, and so, you know, as Justin said, we. We don't necessarily have to declare those folks like OGCI and Boston Consultant Group and other can help with that, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But we can actually take measures to encourage the development of hubs and whether it's, you know, poor space management, um, you know, tactical investments like the one that both of our governments made in the trunk line nearly a decade mm -hmm. ago. Um, there's lots of things that we can do to encourage this. And, you know, certainly with the CCUS strategy, um, the concept of hubs is going to be very central to what we think is, is crucial across the country when it comes to CCUS. And I guess maybe well, that, the, the offer to the to the participants on that point is if you have a great idea for how to enable and accelerate the deployment of hubs, both of us want to hear from you because that, that's what we want to see emerge. So, you know, we're not, government doesn't have a monopoly on good ideas. We, we very much rely on our, our private sector partners and, and NGO partners to help help deliver this thing in the most efficient way possible. Well, that, that is a great um, call to the audience out there. Uh, if you are interested in developing CCS projects, please reach out to Drew Laburn and Justin Wheeler. Both of you, thank you so much for, for joining this session. Um, it was very, very informative. I'm glad we got the technical issues worked out. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Erickson, now uh, to lead us into the next session. So thank you both again. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, first, Matt, can you hear me? I can hear you, Jeff. There we go, okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you, Matt, and thanks to Justin and Drew. Um, you, you know, I, I was actually really excited as I listened to the two of them talk. Um, I have the opportunity, I'm the general manager for client engagement for the Global CCS Institute, and I have the opportunity to talk with folks around the world on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, Canada for the last couple of years has been somewhat flying under the radar. Um, a, a couple of years ago, um, when I would speak with folks in Canada, what I would hear from them is we've made our CCS investment. Now we want to leverage that and, and kind of teach the rest of the world what we know. Well, in just a, sh a short couple of years, I think both the federal government and the Alberta government have pivoted pretty significantly to investing again in the policies and the regulations to get uh, more and more CCS projects uh, developed in the province. And right now, you know, a lot of the spotlight is on the US and Europe with respect to activity for CCS, but Canada's right up where there were the others. And, and the, the, the policy frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, the experience, which is just what we're gonna hear about in just a couple of minutes, and the, uh, uh, the forward looking uh, investment opportunities that we're going to hear from after my session, all of that combines, in my view, to make Canada, you know, a really terrific place to, to invest in CCS. So we're going to dive into that a little bit more over the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm privileged to have an opportunity to have a conversation with uh, two folks that have had significant experience in deploying CCS projects in the province. Jeff Pearson is the president of Wolf, uh, the Wolf Carbon Business Unit, part of Wolf Midstream. And he's going to be talking from his uh, perspective as a participant in the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. Stephen Belthusen is the corporate relations downstream lead for Shell Canada. He's been involved in the Quest project and he's going to talk about that project. Now, most of you that are on this call have heard plenty about ACTL and Quest. So we're going to be very quick with an overview just to make sure everyone's on the same, uh, at the same starting place with what ACTL and, and Quest are about. And then we'll quickly get into the conversation that hopefully will provide some insights to help all of you build the next set of projects in Alberta, what to do and what not to do. And we have just 30 minutes for this, but Hope to have a few minutes also at the end for some audience Q and A. So, with that, uh, Jeff Pearson, I'm going to ask you to kick off and um, start us out with just a couple minutes uh, on a high level overview of the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line before we get into the conversation. 
Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and and thanks to the Global CCS Institute for giving us the opportunity to talk about our system again today. Um, I, I've got just a, a map up here uh, that that has the uh, location in the bottom right. You can see the location of the Alberta carbon trunk line within the province of Alberta. It's got at, at the north end. It's got uh, there, there are two supply sources, two CO2 supply sources for the pipeline. The first is the the newly relatively new NWR Sturgeon refinery, uh, where the, by, the CO2 that's produced is a byproduct of the hydrogen manufacturing that they need in their upgrading process. And, and then we've got the, I guess, not, not that relatively new nutrient uh, redwater fertilizer facility, which has been around for 40 plus years. And they're also producing hydrogen for the purposes of making ammonia fertilizer and had been historically venting the CO2. And, and we take the CO2 from both of those sources. It totals close to 4,400 tons per day today. Um, in, in the case of the Northwest CO2, NWR CO2, we've just got compression. They, they, they give us a, a dry CO2 product, pure CO2 product. We've got, we, we built a large compressor site to handle that. Um, and so we compress that CO2 up to a pipeline pressure. In the case of the nutrient system, they give us a wet CO2 product. So it's about two thirds water one third co2 and we chill it and we remove the water from it to get it in a very dry state um, and then pump it up to refrigerate it turn it into a liquid and pump it up to a pressure to put it in the pipeline uh, we constructed a new 240 kilometer 150 mile uh, 16 inch pipeline which you see in red here and during uh, through which the co2 is transported you can see the capacity of that line about 14.6 uh, megatons per year we're, we're currently transporting on the order of 1.6 megatons per year. And then we deliver that CO2 to our first utilization uh, customer who is Enhanced Energy, who uses that CO2 to, uh, in an enhanced oil recovery process to generate more oil. Uh, and the CO2 is permanently stored through that process and they generate emissions credits. That's our system uh, in a nutshell. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and Stephen, if you could give us a similar overview for the Quest project. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so quickly, uh, you know, Quest is more of an integrated project with dedicated storage. Um, so it's, it's from capture, transport and storage all managed via one operator. And Shell operates the Quest project on behalf of the Athabasca Oil Sands project, which is 70% uh, ownership by CNRL, 20% uh, Chevron, and 10% Shell. We capture from the three hydrogen units within the Scotford upgrader uh, using pre-combustion CO2 capture. So overall, uh, when, when you take your, your net math, it's about 50% reduction overall in the hydrogen production or about one third reduction of uh, overall CO2 emissions for the upgrader. What that means, of course, is we have about 150,000 tons of blue hydrogen for use in the upgrading process. Uh, and then it's, it's the CO2 that's captured and dehydrated. It's transported via a 65 kilometer pipeline uh, north of, of Shell Scotford to uh, Thorhill County for injection into three, well, three wells uh, for storage two kilometers underground in a saline aquifer called the Basal Cambrian Sands. Uh, to date, a little over 6 million tons of CO2 safely stored. And, uh, you know, Quest has had really good performance from day one. So 99% reliability, uh, pr project costs in terms of capital under budget, operating costs under projection, uh, and storage performance has been better than expected. So a really uh, good success story for all involved. Excellent. And, and I want to get back to the question of cost in, in a minute. But the first thing uh, that I just want to talk about and would like both perspectives, actually, you know, what strikes me in comparing these two projects or understanding these two, two projects is they have quite different business and operating models different from each other. Quest is vertically integrated. There's one operator that that uh, uh, manages the capture, the transportation and the storage. Uh, it's uh, dedicated storage and a saline aquifer. On the other hand, Alberta Carbon Trunk Line has different parties that are responsible for the various components, and they utilize enhanced oil recovery. Quest is a single carbon source. ACTL currently has two with plans to, uh, that, you know, they've, they've overbuilt the pipeline to ensure there's an opportunity for additional sources. 
So very different projects from each other. I just want to hear from you, you know, what are the relative um, benefits, drawbacks, other considerations for each? Stephen, if you could start us out with that, and then Jeff, you can jump in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to go back to where we first proposed Quest, right? Um, the operations in terms of the Athabasca oil sands project related to the oil sands. Um, we use hydrogen addition technology, uh, you know, and if you're producing a lot of hydrogen, the main byproduct is CO2. So I think, you know, you look at oil sands development, you looked at our CO2 profile and you said, well, CCS makes a lot of sense here, uh, both in terms of, of reducing that and then to enable future production, uh, mitigate environmental and social concerns related to to the CO2 footprint of oil sands development, at least in the, the structure and the way that we set it up. Um, it, it made sense for us to go in and propose that, that integrated piece. And even dedicated storage in the context of your overall net reductions uh, made a lot of sense for us. So, you know, at the time, as a, as a large scale demonstration project, partnership with government, it, it made a lot of sense. You know, now I think, <laughs> The model is going to move closer to what, what Jeff's going to talk about. And Jeff, maybe I throw it to you then. Thanks, Stephen. And, and yeah, and from a, a ACTL perspective, I mean, I think it's important as well, look at, at the benefits of, of um, shared infrastructure versus, uh, and, and what components of the system are that, if that is applicable to. So when we look at, when we look at the entire CCUS system and we think about capture first, well, in most cases, when you look at, at an emitter and their emission source, the capture projects are likely to be uh, located on their site and very specific to that cap, that uh, emitter. And so, so there's probably less benefit in sharing infrastructure um, on the purely capture side. It's very difficult to move around flue gases long distances or anything. So, so there's, there's less opportunity, I think, for... Uh, for shared scale there. There is, I think, opportunity for infrastructure companies to be partners in that, uh, to bring lower costs of capital to the capture side. Um, but, but so we can, we can put that aside, but when we, we think about it from a pipeline perspective, and, and Jeff, as you said, I mean, we, we overbuilt, uh, and Jason or uh, Justin talked about it earlier today, we overbuilt the ACTL pipeline. And, and that, was, that was a deliberate decision based on the economies of scale building pipelines. Uh, when, when you look at a pipeline construction project, it is, it's largely a civil project. There's a lot of dirt to be moved. You've got to, you, you, you create a trench, you put the pipe in the trench. And, and so it, um, you can look at larger pipe sizes that, uh, wouldn't cost you as much on a, um, so you might, you, you might increase the, the pipe size by 50% and the cost might go up by 30%. And the way that uh, the math works as well is you can get a lot more CO2 through that system. So th there are benefits to, to overbuilding and creating multi-user systems. I think we the, the other thing we see on the pipeline side and um, the, the government funded us and and so we are uh, we have an obligation to be an open access system within that government funding and we we'd operate that way. But I think all all um, and and we'll hear about it more from OGCI as well is. When you pre-build this infrastructure, emitters have the opportunity then to add the capture on their pace and their sequence. So you, you've got now uh, the necessary uh, infrastructure in place to be able to use that and, and for emitters to know it's there. I guess the other thing I'd say, so that's on, on the pipe side, we feel it, it's that way. And it really, you can create a more of a network where you've got multiple users. Ideally, we build up the utilization side, so create more value for the CO2 rather than sure sequestration where it's disposed and and you've got more ideally the network or the pipeline becomes a network to connect multiple emitters and multiple utilization and storage sites and helps de-risk the system and then i think from a, a storage perspective it's got the ability as 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 justin mentioned as well to really be a multi-user system and, and provide economies of scale and optimization around the geology um, through through open access so let me uh, shift over to the business case. Jeff, you, you mentioned yeah. that uh, essentially Wolf got paid by the government to build the pipeline. Talk a little bit, though, about, you know, the uncertainties, um, the business risk, the business drivers for Wolf. Why was it that you decided to be 
uh, you know, to be a partner in the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line and take on all of the uncertainties and perhaps opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I at first probably step back there, Jeff, and I mean, Wolf, Wolf received some of the funding uh, for the pipeline. So, so our total infrastructure cost was around $500 million um, from a Wolf perspective. And so I'm not at liberty to say what, um, what we received as part of our share, but I, I would suggest it's a small component of that. And so as, as Justin, I think mentioned earlier, there was a lot more investment than there was actual government funds put in this. And so Wolf's got a very material position invested um, um, outside of what we received from government funds. But as an infrastructure development company, many on, the, many on this webinar may come from the oil and gas industry. And this is a pretty standard approach. It's called a midstreamer. And, and what the midstreamer does is act as essentially an independent infrastructure company. We, we, we build the infrastructure and then we charge a, a fee for the use of our infrastructure. And that fee would include two components. It would include a, a capital tool that provides us a return on our investment and a return of our investment. And it would provide us an operating tool to cover the cost of operating the system. And, and, and so that's the economics that we got into this. Uh, that, that was the economic rationale for getting into this business. And I think actually, if we were to look around the world, I, I think Wolf, would, uh, Wolf Carbon Solutions would be the first industrial scale independent CO2 infrastructure company in the world, where the rest of the projects we see are, are, are generally integrated with the downstream user of that field. Yeah, great. Now, Stephen, you come from a, a very different perspective. You're a, a shell is an emitter, um, and you have uh, I assume a, a very different business case for investing in carbon capture. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, and it, again, it goes a little bit back to my earlier comments. Um, you know, in today's language, it, it was very much kind of an ESG guided uh, premise where from an environmental standpoint, from a social standpoint, um, we kind of said, if we want to continue to develop the oil sands, we're going to have to start to make uh, make grounds in terms of our, our CO2 performance. And I mean, CCS was an obvious uh, option for us in terms of the technology. The, the real challenge at that time was the economics. Um, and thankfully, it just it, it came together at a time where the government was was in a position to, to step in, both the uh, Canadian government and the provincial government. And together with Shell, we, we made it work. And I, I think, again, in terms of Quest, it was a couple things. You know, it made a material reduction in CO2. Um, you know, it showed leadership in terms of what we could do in Alberta and Canada, uh, you know, and as it relates to the oil sands. Um, the knowledge sharing program and, and how we can now utilize the lessons learned from this project and ACTL and, and, and bring that next wave of projects online kind of all plays into it. I, I think, you know, if I look back then, our reasons were kind of forward looking um, and, and it would have been, you know, next to impossible to do it without government support. Um, and, and that's been changing now in terms of, you know, if we looked at it again, but yeah, that, back then, definitely it was really that, that environmental social lens saying if, if we want to continue to develop, you know, oil sands or, uh, or even, even beyond that, but large scale industrial development, we need to start making some progress here or, or we're just not going to be able to make any headwinds there. So yeah, or headwaves, sorry. So that, that's at, at that time kind of what was before us. So can you, and I'll start with Stephen and Perry to Jeff, the most important one or two lessons that you learned from that experience that will help others avoid the difficulties or mistakes as they develop CCS projects. In other yeah, words, what would I, you do differently next time around? I could probably list a lot of different little technical things, Jeff. Um, and, and I don't know that this is the forum where we get into, you know, I do this, I change that, or, you know, what have you. I, I think there's a few things. So one, um, you know, a, as we move forward, we need to try to replicate or create some level of standard uh, forms of capture. I, I know we want to keep evolving technology and try new things and this is a little better, everything else, but you know, the, the big challenge will continue to be cost. So where we can, can, you know, learn, repeat, uh, replicate, move from kind of custom build to off the shelf, uh, and drive down some of the costs. I think that's important. And, you know, with Quest, we, we say if we were to build it again, 
we could do it 20 to 30 percent less right away just lessons learned replication uh leveraging those plans you know quite easily uh which is, is significant when you're talking about projects uh in excess of a billion dollars so that 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 right there is is big um you know the other thing as it as it relates to cost um I, I think we need to challenge the myth that these things are that costly. It's a lot of money on a cost per ton basis. It's it's competitive, and costs are coming down both uh, you know in terms of capital uh, development and and operations. We we believe costs are already coming down, and as we look at other opportunities, we see some of that. So you know again, leveraging those lessons uh, it is really important. The other thing that perhaps doesn't get talked about as much, and we really used it in Quest, and we need to continue to use it, is technically uh, the way we do CCS right now is not very complex. We've been using this technology in different applications in industry for decades. There's there's nothing new about it. The non-technical issues around CCS, I think, have gotten a little better. They will continue to be a challenge, and we ignore or or aren't mindful of them at our own. You know, <laughs> I, I I I'm. It's always top of mind of me that we we've, we've got to consider those non-technical aspects and those social aspects in terms of as we continue to develop CCS and we push towards uh, develop you know development at a surface standpoint, uh, towns, cities, what have you. Um, you know, as, as we consider the risks. You know, as an operator, I'd say there is very few risks related to it, but the perception of it is, is always challenging. And and Shell, globally, we've been in a number of different opportunities on the CCS front, and, and, it, and there's always challenge around how do you bring society along, how do you bring different public stakeholders along in terms of this is a safe thing to do and we can do it, um, you know, quite well. I, I think that's where we... we still need to work and we don't talk enough about how we continue to build that trust in, in the deployment of the technology. And so you, you hear announcements and, and there's some excitement. I think we also need to be very mindful that, you know, we, we have to demonstrate that we can do this, uh, do this well. Yeah. So Stephen, you mentioned cost uh, without being specific about it, but I know that's the question that I always get. What does it cost to store a ton of CO2? What, what is reported, uh, you know, publicly for cost per ton yep. per quest. Yeah, I mean, $80. Okay. Uh, Canadian, Canadian. $80. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty pretty much free in, in the States, I'd say. But um, yeah, no, $80 Canadian a ton. But with the caveat, and I have to be careful here, each one's going to be a little different. This is pre-combustion capture. Uh, so it's a little bit more efficient there, but this is overall the whole integrated project looking, you know, BZX, CapEx, OpEx, over all the phases, $80 a ton per quest. Great. Jeff, uh, same same couple of questions for you. Start with what you would do differently. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even say do differently. I, I, maybe a couple observations we have through this process, and we spend a lot of time looking at it. We weren't involved at the very beginning when... Uh, was really Northwest and enhanced that put the opportunity together. We'll step into the infrastructure piece in 2018, but I think, I mean, maybe not as specific to Alberta anymore because we've got some enabling infrastructure, but if you're looking at doing this in a new jurisdiction, I think the thing we look at is, um, and, and Stephen would have been able to do this at Shell because they own the whole thing, is you need to look at the economics of the entire system from capture all the way through to storage and understand what that total cost is look at how what the the incentives the government incentives are through emissions reduction and other things to compare that against the total cost of the system so you can't look at you can't look at one component in in, in isolation is what i would suggest when you're building these new systems when you start when you've got the enabling infrastructure in place you can then start to segment your economics but in order to get a new system off the ground you've got to look at the economics of the entire system yep. um, and so that's that's one thing. I mean, I think the thing we learned through this, uh, especially on the pipeline side, um, is, is just there. A lot of the, the stuff we do is pretty um, general to oil and gas. It's, it's general oil and gas technologies, but but there are some nuanced things. Like our pipeline is uh, the, the pressures you often do this at are are higher than you would generally see in the oil and gas industry. And it results in a, the use of a, a thicker, uh, thicker walled pipe, which has a number of knock-on effects. That's done for the, the purposes of safety and ensuring that we're able to operate a safe system. 
it just it just leads to logistics uh, challenges, manufacturing challenges, and just just nuanced things. I think that you learn as you go to it. Um, but but as Stephen said, it's probably it's probably a thousand little things rather than one big thing that that you learn by doing this that help you to do the next one. Yep. It's a bunch of little optimizations. So Jeff, we've had several questions come in, uh, actually a lot of specific or technical questions. Instead of going to, to the, specific, the, the specific technical questions, um, a lot of these imply interest in getting, um, getting engaged with the ACTL, participating in the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, either as an emitter that would play into the pipeline or perhaps as an off-taker of CO2 for utilization. What, what can you tell folks about the way they can get involved on the commercial side, the operational side of the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. Yeah, I mean, I just say, uh, give me a call. I mean, as I mentioned, I mean, as I mentioned before, it's uh, the, the government put a large amount of funding into the, the entire system. We've got an obligation to run an open access system, and we would do that in, in any respect. I think we feel that the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line can. Uh, move Alberta ahead at, in a, at a quicker pace than a jurisdiction that doesn't have any infrastructure. And, and which is why I think Alberta is an attractive jurisdiction for CCUS, in addition to sort of the, uh, a number of the other things that Justin mentioned. But we're, we're looking for new sources of emission. We're looking for, for new, new utilizers as well. And, and be that you are, be it saline aqua for storage, we think there's an opportunity to use the infrastructure to really de-risk the growth of the CCUS industry. I mean, it's, it's one interesting thing the government's doing today is when we look at all of these, I think depending on the hat you're wearing and where you come from, you, you view the risk differently in the entire CCUS value chain. Some people think it's really around the capture side. Other people think it's around the storage side. Some think it's around transportation. But I think the thing we would say is the cost of the transport and sequestration is generally in many jurisdictions, Alberta specific, a lot, like, lot lower than the cost of the capture. So the more you de risk that, like having many suitable places to put the CO2 in, you don't wake up every night wondering if you filled your reservoir up. All of those things lead to more activity on the capture side. And so we believe the ACTL can be a large um, value add in moving the system forward. And I just ask them to, to, to reach out to Wolf Carbon Solutions. Good, good. Good answer. I'm going to uh, flip a question to Stephen. While I'm doing that, Jeff, your audio is coming through a, a bit uh, murky, so you may want to make that change that we tried earlier this week uh, to clear that up. Stephen, uh, talk a bit about the um, about the incentives that applied to uh, Quest, whether it was the tax incentives or other. I, I know you got capital grants um, from the, the province and from the federal government, but talk a bit about some of the other um, tax incentives and other. Uh, financial incentives that apply to Quest. Yeah, so so the big one is it relates to Quest um, because it was a dedicated storage project, and we couldn't, uh, you know, raise money by doing enhanced oil recovery, for instance, or or make money on the back end. Uh, there was a recognition that to to work the economics at that time, given where the carbon price was, given uh, the new amount of money we were talking, that there would be a double credit, a double carbon tax credit, basically. Um, but there's math involved in that as well. Uh, so the project can't become net revenue positive. Uh, it has to say, stay neutral uh, at best. And the moment, you know, if, if we start making money, then we have, we come out of our funding agreement with the province and, and that full funding amount won't be granted. Um, and, and likewise with the double credits, um, you know, there's a there's a point where that it reaches a maximum value too. So if carbon price keeps going up. You know that that doesn't mean that we can continue to get double credits at that price. So there's a there's a cap on that. And, and were the double credits kind of a one off to uh, incentivize Shell as an early mover, or are did those apply? Yeah. No. So it, it's it's related to Quest, and it's not a uh, it's not a program that you know is open to everyone. It was part of the. Again, that's why I characterize Quest as very much as a demonstration project. Um, everything related to it from, from the economic structure, the funding model, uh, the first of a kind in, in terms of the build and where it is. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty at the time of build related to the economics and stuff has changed. I, I mean, admittedly, you know, I, I don't think it, uh, it is, it, it should be plain, painfully ob obvious that is carbon pricing changes your economics change, right? 
Um, so it, it's in a different spot today. I wouldn't expect uh, the same arrangement if we were to pro propose it today. Yeah, and, and remind folks, it was more than a decade ago, right? When I think when you were developing plans for Quest. So, so much has changed in the province and in uh, uh, federal with federal incentives as well. Jeff, anything to add from you um, with respect to ACTL's uh, uh, financial incentives, ongoing tax credits, anything else that would apply both to ACTL and projects going forward? I, I mean, I, I think, uh, again, the, the space in which the, the Quest project and ACTL received their funding, that was, I guess, uh, over 10 years ago. And the, I think the world was a lot different then than it is today, where uh, we heard about it from Drew and, and from Justin, that the governments have a lot more ongoing incentives and desire to move this forward, it feels like today, than just pure capital grants um, or capital and operating grants. So there's a lot of these programs. I think the challenge for the industry will be understanding how all of these programs stack, intertwine, and, and the risk around them and how that results in um, a decision to move forward on these 20 and 30 year uh, large capital projects. Very good. Well, I know for both uh, projects, because you received significant uh, public funding, there, uh, I think uh, one of you at least mentioned that there's an obligation to be transparent. I know that ACTL has a, an annual report that they put out that's posted mm -hmm. publicly. Um, Shell likewise has been transparent with Quest. Uh, uh, if, uh, if we can find a way that because there's a lot of specific technical questions, probably a lot of those would get resolved through the documents that you put out in the public domain. Um, and hopefully perhaps by the end of the, uh, uh, the webinar, uh, if you guys can post those in the chat, the, the websites where folks can get access to that technical resource, um, that'll save, uh, give, them, give them the answers to the questions, but save us from going through that on this webinar. So with that, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. We're right at time and uh, great insights. Guys, thanks very much. Um, appreciate your leadership, both of your organizations, your leadership in deploying CCS in Alberta, in Canada, and globally, and look forward to uh, continuing to work with your organizations on future projects as well. Um, at this point, we're going to take a break. We're going to take five minutes, give everyone a chance to stretch their legs, uh, and then we'll come back, and, and uh, we have about an hour left to go in the webinar. Um, the clock on my computer says 432, so if yours says, four, well, 432 East Coast, it would be 232 Mountain Time. If that's what yours says, uh, come back at uh, 2.37, uh, and we'll see you all in five minutes. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay, and I hope everyone had a great short break. So I had the pleasure of running our last session for today, CCS Plans and Possibilities. So I'd ask all my panelists to turn on their audio and video when they have a second. So we've all seen all the exciting announcements related to CCS in Alberta in the last few months. And while these announcements are recent, they're not really surprising. Because as we've heard today, Alberta has an experienced CCS ecosystem with resources available for project development opportunities along the entire CCS value chain. So collaborative projects are being undertaken and will continue to be undertaken in Alberta. And those projects are gonna include the use of CCUS to mitigate CO2 emissions and support the transition to our existing energy system. And Alberta, as we heard as well, has supported the development of CCS projects and technologies for many years. So today we're gonna to hear from four amazing panelists that all have roles in the CCS value chain. And we're gonna hear their thoughts on future collaborations and possibilities for CCS in Alberta and Canada. So I'm gonna start by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and then they're gonna provide a brief overview about what they do and their role in the CCS ecosystem. And then we'll have some moderated questions and finish with open Q&A from the audience. So please feel free to drop your questions in while the panelists are presenting and we're going through the other questions. So Ian, I'd like to call on you first, please. Sure, so thanks very much. Um, I'm Ian McDonald and I work for Shell. And within Shell, I'm based within what's called Group Carbon. And my primary sort of role within Group Carbon is looking at developing CCS policies and working with external relationships that Shell have. The primary one for Shell is what's called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. 
and I actually lead the CCUS work stream for the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. And if you see here from the companies involved, it's 12 of the major IOCs or NOCs around the world. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of our major focuses of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is CCUS, along with other climate mitigation purposes. And it's, the OGCI is all around the, the purposing these companies to, to uh, make Paris Agreement happen. Uh, they've also contributed to a climate investment fund of over $1 billion that invests in CCS projects and also CCS technologies. But we won't go into that in too much detail uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a few years ago, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative identified that hubs were a key area to look at to help kick off CCS development globally. And so we identified the projects that we were working on that we could identify as hubs. And we basically started pushing out our Kickstarter initiative that looked at basically helping to transfer the knowledge of, of how these hubs are developing, how to do them, what the policy and frameworks uh, framework where they were needed to help these hubs mature into real projects and actually have steel in the ground and so we have basically four hubs that we have with projects are are current as very well known to you all probably net zero t side northern lights uh, rotterdam which is the porthos project and also another one in china we also have others that are under development now with ogci areas we've seen as high potential for ccs projects and they include our Texas hub, Louisiana, and also one now in Edmonton, and also another in, in, in uh, Italy. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. We realized that we really needed to see well, these countries were places where a lot of the frameworks were already in place. Uh, and so we wanted to see, well, what's missing in other countries around the world? Why aren't these kicking off in South America and Southeast Asia? What's the missing ingredients? Uh, and so we basically kicked off a global hub search where we basically excluded, uh, excluded some countries that we knew were working well. And also we excluded China and Saudi because we were already doing internal studies to how they were working. And so we looked at 52 other countries around the world and we sort of phased this and study in, in a way that we could uh, so sort of do this this work in two phases. Uh, phase one being Canada and the EU, where lots of data was available, readily available, so the consultants could work on it quickly. And then the rest of the world, uh, which was a lot harder to get the information for. If you go to the next slide, so you see that basically the, the idea that we had here was, well, let's look at the emissions and actually what is the size of the emissions and the, whether it's high purity or not, and the type of emission, because that will have a knock-on effect on the cost. And whereabouts would the storage be for these emissions uh, and then any, any local pipelines, so indicating the rights of way so we could actually have that transport network built. Uh, and then we could apply to those particular emitters the actual technical economic costs of applying capture to that particular type of industry and whether it's high purity or, or low purity coming from that industry, because quite often there will be a mix of, of different types of uh, high uh, purity of CO2 and then build these into sort of type of clusters uh, and, and hubs eventually that link to storage. And we looked at this from a technical economics perspective, so really trying to bear which hubs can be the lowest cost. And sometimes they would emit, they would exclude high cost emitters. So we could actually get that hub running and those other uh, emitters would be included in a different hub, but it would be higher overall cost. Uh, but we also applied a lens, a qualitative lens of policy and regulatory sort of screen to these countries uh, and, and individual hubs as well to understand well, what, what's the internal mechanisms of that country? Is there a carbon pricing mechanism? Are there actually CCS commitments in their NDC? Does the oil and gas industry exist in that country? And how, how much will it have the, therefore the, the supply chain um, already embedded in that country to support oil and gas that's needed to support CCS, et cetera? And so that allowed us to start looking at the, and prioritize where, what uh, um, hubs we should be looking at uh, potentially in the future to prioritize for deployment. So if you go to the next slide, very briefly, you'll see that globally, uh, we had a whole bunch of hubs identified, over 200 around the world. And interestingly, uh, the little green dots in that world map are less than $50 per tonne potential hubs for our preferred uh, size cluster. So an initiation, basically. But they're spread throughout the world. 
Uh, there's not just a, a, a agglomeration of them in certain parts. These exist throughout the world, which is really encouraging for CCS. And particularly for Canada, we actually have one here in Edmonton as well. Other hubs around Edmonton are also quite uh, advantageously uh, uh, with their sort of low cost, primarily driven by the, the great um, storage available in Alberta that really helps reduce the, the, the costs. Uh, and we identified in, in, in Canada, for example, five hubs uh, that were below $100 per tonne, and they accounted for around, around about 50 million tonnes per annum. Obviously, within those hubs, that 50 million tonnes, there are other um, decarbonisation levers that could be deployed rather than CCS to decarbonise those assets, but those are just the emissions that, that, we, that we noted. And CCS uh, in Canada really had by far the most favourable policy and regulatory environment that there was out of all the countries we looked at. And that was prior to all the announcements in the last six months, which has just made the environment even more uh, interesting and certainly helping to develop a commercial CCS industry. Uh, next slide. Another thing is the OGCI have been doing, looking at storage resources catalog. So really important to understand uh, and we've heard some numbers earlier, but the, the potential um, quantities of CO2 that can be stored uh, in, in Canada, well, the same applies around the world. There's lots of these numbers batted around and it's actually be able to understand, well, let's have a standardized way of looking and assessing how much CO2 can be stored in these reservoirs. And so through the SPE, the storage resource management system was created and OGCI is now going around the world, looking at certain countries looking at the published data and the CO2 storage analysis, et cetera, and try to standardize the understanding of how much CO2 is available in those countries. And we've done that for Canada already, and this is all publicly available on our website. But we really encourage, uh, encourage project developers to start to follow the SRMS methodology. Um, and I think that really sums up how we are playing in this uh, environment for OGCI. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you for that great overview. Uh, Joy, can I ask you to go next, please? Sure. Thank you. So um, I'm Joy Romero. I'm Vice President of Technology Innovation at Canadian Natural Resources Limited. And I also play in the uh, collaborative space um, for oil and gas in, in Canada. Um, part of forming COSIA, Canada's Oil Science Innovation Alliance as well as participating in the Petroleum Technology Alliance for Canada, um, the Clean Resource Innovation Network uh, across the en entire country, the Methane Submission um, Reduction Collaborative. So a number just that, how do we work together to, um, to solve hard things? And uh, so next slide, please. A little bit about uh, Canadian Natural. We're the largest oil and gas producer in the in the in the country. Um, we operate in North America and BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan, a little bit in Manitoba, the North Sea, and offshore West West Africa and South Africa. Um, of course, there's a huge commitment um, in in these uh, these the, where we operate uh, to drive to uh, net zero. And, um, you know, so what does that look like? Uh, next, please. So in addition to technologies that just, you know, reduce CO2 in the first place um, uh, in, our, in our operations, uh, we are, have been <laughs> um, operators and developers of CO2 for a long time. So you obviously heard Quest, uh, we're very proud of, of that work and of course that uh, Shell is the operator and, and was the developer of this. We were very proud to be there and, and to have the ability of this knowledge, um, obviously for further work that we do. And uh, Northwest Redwater, you heard that today as that feeds into um, the uh, Alberta Carbon Trunk Line and is used for enhanced oil recovery. Of course, Quest is, is storage. Horizon is a little known uh, operation, which is uh, 4 million tons. We actually began the design for this in 2002. So I, I think a message that should be heard with respect to Alberta, and I think you've, you've, you've heard this many times, uh, is this is something that we've actually been at for a while. 
And the storage mechanism there is actually sequestration, sequestration in, our, in our tailings pond. Um, and we actually have another small uh, facility um, that's a, a natural gas facility that we capture CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. And I think that that variability of, of both, um, now these three here are all capture on hydrogen facilities, which of course uh, leads to the blue hydrogen experience, which you know again, we're very proud of, of understanding what this is and what it takes to both build and develop. Um, but is also how does this integrate in, 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 in different facilities in different ways. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, next slide, please. So we're very excited. Canadian Natural is one of five different companies that has uh, just announced uh, the uh, Pathways to Net Zero Initiative, Oil Sands Pathway to Net Zero Initiative. Um, this together with, of course, uh, Synovus, Imperial, Meg and Suncor represents 90% of the uh, production for, for, for oil sands. Um, this will be um, a, a carbon capture uh, trunk line as well, you know, capturing from all of our facilities and of course, others who wish to, to uh, whether it be the oil sands or other heavy emitters um, are, are welcome, as well as to a, a hub in the Cold, cold Lake area. And again, um, others are welcome in addition in, in addition to, to us. Um, this will also include uh, the, the um, technology development as well as the various um, things to from a process improvement, energy efficiency, fuel switching, electrification, um, hydrogen, everything that that you need to pull together to end up at at, at net zero um, on our on our facilities so um, really excited about this and uh, we'll discuss a little bit more as as we as we move on so back to you thanks joy and yes we have so much to talk about um, so I get my video on there. <laughs> But I definitely want to uh, have everyone else have a chance to give their short overview. Um, Brett, can I ask you to go next, please? Uh, thank you, Christina, for ha having me on this, uh, this wonderful panel. My name is Brett Hankel, I'm, and I'm a co-founder uh, back in 2007, and I'm vice president of strategic accounts. Uh, at Svante, so I look after new applications and look after our major our, our major partnerships. Uh, I also am responsible for the uh, operations of our two uh, pilot plants, one with Synovus in Saskatchewan uh, outside of Lloydminster, and one here in Richmond, British Columbia, with uh, with uh, uh, Lafarge Wholesome. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about Svante, we are developing second generation CO2 capture based on solid adsorption. We have uh, spent about $75 million US uh, since the inception of the company in 2007. And we're, we're happy to announce that we actually just closed a round of financing for $100 million US uh, early this year. And, and we're happy to bring on some, some new investors of uh, Suncor Energy and EDC and Temasek and Chart and Carbon Direct. So really great list of uh, deep strategic investors and including OGCI, as you can see there and, and the representation from Synovus and Suncor and the, and the uh, um, Canadian government is fantastic. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit about our technology very quickly. We take solid adsorption. So adsorbents are, are materials that grab onto CO2 and let nitrogen pass. We take these new adsorbents that we are developing and others around the world are developing. We uh, coat it onto a substrate and we build what looks like a filter structure. Okay, we put this filter structure in, in some, uh, we leverage uh, older technology called air preheaters or Lungstrom wheels, uh, uh, rotating heat exchangers. We put the filter inside of this wheel. It turns a batch process into a continuous process and it, and it uh, has features that um, 
uh, ha give us the opportunity to, to reduce the capital cost of the system because it's, it's smaller and simpler. Also, uh, the materials can be more robust to oxida uh, oxygen and SOX and NOx. And also very easily we can load, follow and stop and start, which we're learning is a, is a key uh, feature that's needed in, in, uh, with flue gas because there's much more variability in, uh, in flue gas and stopping and starting than, uh, than we originally thought. So that's just a basis of the uh, uh, basics of the technology. Uh, but welcome to you know, answer more whoever reaches out to me. So next slide, please. Just want to touch base on our market focus. So on the left hand side here is what we're doing now in in uh, in CO2 capture, basically nothing about 40 uh, uh, megatons per year. The IEA is, is 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 showing that there's a potential for CO2 capture to be 10 gigatons per year. So it's just a, a staggering number that is potential there. And, and uh, really we, we see and, and agree with the IE that it's really North America that will lead uh, this is just, just because the infrastructure is, is already here. So we have a bit of a head start on other places in the world. Uh, and we see the majority of being US and Canada uh, is for sure in the, in the first 10 years. On the right hand side is the, is the uh, potential CO2 sources. You can see that a lot of them are from industrial emissions and that's what we're concentrating on the hard to abate emissions. So cement and lime production, uh, you know, key big footprint in the world of cement and lime, and, and we're going to make more cement and lime for sure. So that, that's a big target for us. Hydrogen production, obviously we're supporters of the hydrogen economy. If you can capture the CO2 and make blue, blue hydrogen, it's a, it's a fantastic pathway of utilizing our natural resource of, of natural gas. And other, other industrial uh, emitters like steel, uh, chemical production, plastic production, and things like that. We are also uh, working in the direct air capture space through our partner, Climeworks. Uh, we're, we're acting as a vendor and, and helping out uh, with with their technology any way we can, uh, so that's a that's a snapshot of who Svante is, and I'll I'll turn it over to the next and and uh, move on to the on to the panel. Thank you. Yeah, Brett, thanks very much. Um, our last panelist, Candice Patton from Enhance. Thanks, Candice. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm so excited to be here with the panel today. Uh, my name is Candace Patton. I'm the Director for Regulatory Affairs and External Relations at Enhance Energy. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. I'm really excited to talk to you about the project today. It's um, the full ACTL project. Jeff from Wolf did such a wonderful job of explaining it to you, so I won't go into detail. But essentially, um, Enhanced Energy is the company that sits at the end of the Alberta carbon trunk line in central Alberta at our field in Clive and sequesters about 1.7 million tons of CO2 per year um, in, in our fields there. I'm really excited about this because we started this uh, pipeline up in, or we started our sequestration oper uh, at op operations up in June of 2020. And so just in March of this year, we celebrated our million ton milestone. And that was a, a really exciting milestone to reach. Um, and sitting today, June 23rd, we've just surpassed the 1.5 million ton milestone. So it's growing every day. And I think the, the message that I love to share with folks when I'm talking about this project is, is how meaningful, how safe and scalable this is and, and how that large scale emissions reductions that we can enable through technologies like CCS and CCUS uh, really start to, to paint the picture of how we're going to meet our climate change goals. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a couple of pictures um, for you because these are some of my favorites. Um, Etterfields and Clive, um, they're, they're really wonderful because they access this amazing geology that Ian referenced um, and we sequester these emissions 2000 meters um, below ground into depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs and at the moment use that CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Um, it's neat because our geology in central Alberta is accessible with road and, and rail and highways and power and all of those sorts of things that really are, are required not to mention the Alberta carbon trunk line to make projects like this feasible. Um, so we're, we really are sitting on um, a great place in Alberta with great potential to do projects like CCS and CCUS. 
Um, I do want to talk about the the operations with sequestration, uh, whether it's CCS or CCUS. One of the, the great things about it is that we know it's permanent, we know it's safe, and we're building that confidence and that certainty for uh, large scale emitters through the work that we've done over decades and decades of, of knowledge and research into the measurement, monitoring, and verification of those emissions. And that's something I think that Enhance is really proud of. The work that we've done with the regulator, with the government of Alberta to develop these plans and really understand that when you put a molecule of CO2 into our geology, that we can verify that it's there to stay. And that's such a critical part of providing confidence in the system, not only within Alberta and our operations here, but globally and, and how we are moving um, truly towards meeting those climate change goals. The other thing about that, that system and, and the close work that Alberta has, um, you know, and, and referencing Ian again, you talked about how that policy really is, is special in Canada um, and how it's, it's such a great place to do business like this. Um, by working hand in hand with the regulators and the government of Alberta, um, you're seeing the, the offset system as a, a place where that's driving value into these projects and, and why you're seeing, you know, projects like Quest and, and the ACTL and ones that are, are being announced in future to come um, landing here because there's value in the system. There's value through those offsets and the credits that are generated by sequestering CO2. And that's related to our measurement, monitoring and verification plans. It's, it's related to having a sequestration entity be able to verify that those omissions are permanent. And that offset that's created at the sequestration entity then flows throughout the system towards the transportation entities up towards the, the large emitters and the folks that are investing in the system end to end benefit from those, those offsets and credits. And that generates the value um, to have these projects uh, become reality and become feasible in, in the system. I'll go to the next slide, please. So I think the main message I want to chat and to, to leave you with is that from capture to transport to sequestration, I think Jeff, you said this really well earlier, you know, some people focus on, you know, it's all about the capture and that's the important part, or it's all about the transport and that's the important part. It's all about the sequestration. And I mean, here I am from Enhanced, so that's that's certainly a, a little bit of, of my bias, but it really is a full value chain. And the amount of collaboration um, from business models all the way through operations to how the offsets are generated, working with regulators, working with government and having that value flow throughout the system is so important to really making these projects viable um, and exciting for Alberta. So I, I hope that we get a lot more opportunity to chat, uh, chat more about collaboration as, as the panel and the questions continue. Um, but it's one of the, the main focus points for Enhanced today is the collaboration across the system and, and how that really moves the needle on our ability to manage carbon emissions. Thanks, Christina. No, well, thank you, Candice. Um, appreciate that overview. And if I could get all my panelists to turn their audio and video back on, uh, that'd be fantastic. Because I wanted to start off before we go to the audience Q&A um, with a few moderated questions. And uh, some of you did touch on this in your opening presentation, um, but you know, as we've heard all day, Alberta is a unique place um, that where it has all the components of the CCS ecosystem already in place, um, lots of experience, lots of expertise. So I think it would be helpful for the audience to understand um, if I could ask each of you about um, where you sit in the CCS value chain and, and really what are your views on, on collaboration and, and how you're adding value or, or think you can add value to the, to the CCS ecosystem. Ian, let me start with you for the, for the big picture. Sure. So, I mean, OGCI is a collective of, of companies, as you know, and where we sit in the value chain depends on which project you look at in which member company. You know, we have the, the Rotterdam projects that we have, which is ExxonMobil and, and uh, Shell that are contributing its CO2 into a, a shared transport and storage network that's run by uh, three uh, basically state entities, Porto Rotterdam, Gas Uni uh, and um, EBN. So, you know, from there we play the emitter role, whereas if you look at something like Northern Lights, it's the exact opposite. The Total, Equinor and Shell are providing that transport and storage option for those hot, um, difficult locations that can't really get to stores very easily and looking to potentially pull that for the whole of Northwest Europe, as well as other hubs uh, around Northwest Europe that are being developed. 
And then you look at net zero T site. Again, that's a different example where we have an anchor project sort of put forward by the, the member companies. And that is, again, a bit like the Wolf example is sort of engineering its pipeline for the CO2 to be larger than its own CO2 production. But having struck MOUs with members around it in the industrial cluster, uh, we can look at uh, sort of maximizing the, the capacity to decarbonize uh, the, the, the T's area. And actually with the sort of shared storage that we, they're looking at, uh, potentially decarbonize the Humber uh, cluster as well in the UK. So our member companies play all across the whole board uh, in this particular area, not one, but I think we've already heard really that collaboration is key here. And it's not just about collaborating internally within OGCI and our member companies and, you know, trying to look at what's the best situation for having CCS in particular context, but also really so working with our government. So I didn't mention, but it's there in the slides, our collaboration with people like the Clean Energy Ministerial, which is a sort of very high level um, group of uh, company, uh, countries that are very keen on, on developing clean energy uh, technologies, but there's a particular CCS initiative within that. So we work quite closely with them, uh, looking at how to decarbonize various parts of the world, but also offering a good sounding board for them to, to to have their ideas with us and they then allow obviously when we talk about hubs they can give the, the governmental viewpoint and what we're saying etc um and and really when we look at what's going to happen in the future what's key to also bring in is other stakeholders not just the emitters and then the stores uh, etc but the finance people this is going to be really critical because even big companies that are within OGCI we just don't have that capital spend potential to ramp up the CCS that is needed to happen to meet the net zero um, by 2050 projections of the IEA for example so we really need to bring those finance people into the discussion and we've got understand how to speak uh, in their language and talk and, and understand their risk understanding so we can uh, talk about CCS to them and, and really get them to understand the risks associated with CCS uh, and, and where those risks really lie. But yeah, uh, collaboration is key. Um, the Quest project is a good example where, where really the, we have it hand in hand, share went hand in hand with the regulator to help develop those regulations and sort of it's really sort of it was a learning experience for both, but that has been repeated in other jurisdictions. Uh, the UK, for example, working very closely with the UK government to, to find the, the business models. And that is not only uh, the oil and gas industry, but also the, the other industries in, in the UK that are dependent uh, on CCS to decarbonize and, and to meet the UK's net zero uh, ambitions. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, That's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, okay. I, I'll stop there. I could, okay. I could talk for a long time, so I'll, I'll let someone else jump in. No, no worries at all. Sorry about that. I, I heard you pause and I thought that was your final thought. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to ask Joy her thoughts on collaboration. And I know, Joy, you're you're deeply involved in the oil sands, oil sands Net Zero pathway, and that's an amazing alliance that's recently been announced. So can you can you talk about collaboration and, of course, whatever you can share about that, that um, alliance that's recently been announced? Sure. Um, you know, so certainly as a company, you know, from where we fit in the value chain, obviously we're source, we're, we're a sink, we're in between. Um, also, you know, when you talk about collaboration, it's collaboration with the companies that are involved, but it's also, as Ian was saying, it's collaboration with all levels of government. It's collaboration with the regulators to have things in place to make sure that these, these things work. Um, collaboration with uh, the technology suppliers and and providers that are that are that are there. So um, there's you have to collaborate with the entire e ecosystem that's there. Now Pathways builds on all of these collaborative organizations and and the innovation ecosystem across the country. So it 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 has many different ways in which to um, in which to execute. Uh, so obviously, COSIA, Canada's Oil Science Innovation Alliance, has created a great um, structure and framework to be able to build build on here, with additional components that will need to 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 be built out. But it, at any one time, you know, or any one sort of, if you look at decade as you go through, 
in a decade now, there is technologies that are commercial and ready to execute infrastructure that needs to be developed. But there's also a development component that, that is, is, is there. And we've committed to share in pathways across that, that full spectrum, the development side, the energy efficiency components, and in the what we know today of what can be built and, and executed. So, um, because you need to always strive to um, drive value. And we know that every phase that you go through can in essence drive more, more, more value. And as Drew was saying earlier, um, you know, very on at the beginning, CO2 itself has a value. And so how do we bring this from, uh, you know, being able to produce, hydrocarbons at net zero um, so that we reduce greenhouse gas and you know or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions to actually utilizing the co2 for all of the value that it has and that every every spectrum in between and we've committed to work work on that at an even more intense focus and speed than um, than we have previously which is um, which is already remarkable, uh, literally around the globe in, in which that has been done. So um, highly important and highly focused and uh, absolutely need all of the partners in the entire innovation ecosystem to deliver. Joy, thank you for that perspective. I appreciate that and what you shared on the new um, oil sands net pathways to net zero. Uh, Brett, can I ask you as a technology provider, um, you know, your role in the CCS value chain and how you're looking at collaboration? Absolutely. We, we really want to be a technology provider, right? We, we want to, to manufacture and, and deploy our core technology, right? But that's, uh, that's, that's not how we've had to operate to date yet. In the future, that, that it, it'll become that. But right now, we have to be, uh, you know, right in the center of most of our projects. So give you an example with our Lafarge Wholesome project in Colorado. They're, they're, you know, the, the project developers that just pull everything together are just emerging now. They're, they're coming online. There's, there's many, there's midstream oil and gas companies that are interested in doing that. There's lots of companies interested in doing that. It's emerging. But right now, Svante is still having to pull together all the pieces. So we're the interface mm -hmm. between the offtaker of the CO2, Occidental Petroleum. We're the interface with Lafarge Wholesome, the, the emitter. We're dealing with the EPC Kiwit we're dealing with the U.S. Department of Energy, the, the money's flowing through us, you know, and we're, we're dealing with any financial banks that are looking at investing in the project. We're, we're at the center of that. We don't want to stay at the center of that. And, and that's going to change in time for sure as project developers enter the space. So collaboration is, is I don't think any of these projects actually happen without collaboration. Uh, there's just too many pieces to the puzzle, right? right to, for, for one entity to really take it on. So, no, yeah, thank you for clarifying that for me. I remember you mentioning it before how much you're very in the middle. So, but I think that's a great insight for the audience. Um, Candace, any more you want to add about? Um, you talked a little bit about the uh, how you monetize the storage aspect, um, but do you want to add some more as to how you guys are viewing collaboration? Sure, and I, I think I want to pick up on on Brett's putting the the puzzle pieces together because there are so many of them, and I think that's where enhance at in the at the end of the carbon value chain at the end of the trunk line and sequestering the molecules of co2 um that's what our role really in that system is, is providing certainty it's working with partners and saying well okay if, if you are committed to to capture and if you are committed to emissions management do you want to be following that molecule making sure it's permanent and then uh, watching it for the next you know so many decades or, or whatnot to make sure that permanence and so it's really cool having um, operators like Canadian Natural and Joy here and you know Ian and the Shell perspectives that we've been hearing from um, because there are great examples of, of large integrated projects like Quest where you've got an, a large multinational who can do that start to finish 
But that's not the case for everybody. And it's not the case for a lot of industries that want to decarbonize, that want to make sure that they have solutions and plans in place for managing carbon emissions. And so when you can pair an operator like Enhance and, you know, um, Wolf Midstream and, and that transport and capture solu or sequestration solution with a company that's committing to capturing and working with technology providers like Brett, when you put that all together, that's magic, I think. That's where we're going to start to see um, the hard to abate um, sectors start to find solutions for their carbon emissions. So I get really excited about that type of collaboration. And then I think the second part of that is, again, the value. Um, infrastructure is so critically important. And so when we think about, um, you know, and, and Jeff made this comment about how, you know, it, Enhance has been around for 10 years, you know, Northwest Redwater Partnership and Enhance started this ACTL project 10 years ago. Um, and, and we've been working on, on getting this going. Um, but when you when you want to build infrastructure, when you want to start looking at these hubs, you need to have that value and, and see where the opportunity for investment is. And I think that's so critical saying if you capture molecules CO2 and let it go, there's no value there. There's no environmental benefit there. When you, if you transport a molecule from A to B, you still don't have kind of that environmental benefit. And so it's not until that molecule is stored permanently and you've got a company that's willing to take on that measurement monitor and verification and make sure that offset is a genuine offset, a reduction in the molecules to our atmosphere. That's where the value is created. That's where the offset's created. But of course, this is all in partnership. And that, that's where the collaboration becomes very, very important. How does that value flow back up the carbon value chain? So again, it's in working with partnerships, it's in developing these projects together and making sure that the business models, the innovation around business models is supporting your, your carbon management goals. No, thanks very much, Candace. And thanks for clarifying that. That's really helpful. Um, Everyone's had such great answers and I'm, I'm just mindful of time. So I'm gonna go on to the next moderated question and I just ask the panelists to sort of, you know, let me know if you wanna respond and answer uh, cause I know we wanna cover a couple of key topics before we run out of time today. The next thing we were gonna talk about was um, lower carbon products. And, you know, globally the Institute has seen um, a demand for lower carbon products. Um, the trend's gone from a preference by a subset of buyers to table stakes in many industries. And I'd love to hear from panelists if they're seeing the influence of this trend in Alberta. And if so, is it is it driving CCS investments and, and or what can Alberta bring to the world by utilizing CCS in that low carbon product space? Anyone wanna go first? <laughs> Sure, Christine, maybe I can jump in here. Um, okay. You know, I, I think, again, there's so much opportunity in Alberta um, for energy transition technologies, whether that's blue hydrogen or the petrochemicals industry. Um, and I, I think uh, we had a, a recent sort of partnership announcement with Nautical, uh, which is a company developing a blue methanol facility. And that is so exciting um, to us because, um, carbon capture and the solution around carbon management is, is critical and integrated right into what um, Nautical wants to be doing with their project. Um, and so we're working on uh, working with them to provide the sequestration. So again, it's another opportunity to partner and enable a new um, industrial operation to, to start up in Alberta for them to right from the get-go look how new products and drive investment um, with a low carbon solution that's been been fully integrated right from the beginning. No, that sounds, that's really cool. Thank you, Candace, for that answer. Um, Joy, I, I know you, I don't know if you were going to put your hand up or not, but I, I wanted to go back to you because we did talk about how um, with the with the trend in the lower carbon products that the oil sands producers, you know, really had an opportunity to lead, be part leaders in that transition of the energy system based on all the technology pathways that you're undertaking. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure, I think what's really important in here is, you know, obviously we're going to be producing hydrocarbons with zero, zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what a lot of people don't realize is that we actually generate our footprint by using our own product. 
So these technologies, in essence, can be transferred to anybody who uses our product. So it really, this is to an end use transition. So this isn't just about producing hydrocarbons. It's about the ability of the globe to use the energy density that's in hydrocarbons in energy systems around the globe. And so not just in, in Canada. So it's, it's, it, these technologies can be used by any sector, as of course Brent knows. Uh, we heard him talk about a number of them uh, today. And it also allows um, us to, to generate energy and, and use that energy and take these technologies and literally use them across the country at any sector and almost any, you know, you saw the, you know, we saw the sources uh, maps today. It is incredible when you look around the globe and you see the sink maps because they sometimes people talk about them being isolated in certain locations that are well known like Alberta they're actually across the entire country and around the entire globe and so the types of 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 information that's coming out of Quest, that's coming out of the work that Enhance is doing, that's coming out of the work that Boundary Dam and others is the safety associated with that storage and it's so important and I think that was you know others have talked about uh, today is people understanding the safety of that storage so we can in fact take advantage of these technologies for the globe to in essence meet our our our, uh, our goals our, our the challenges to one and a half or, or wherever you want to fall in these spectrums but where we need to move so you know we've been doing these technologies for a while we're now moving to the second generations we're lowering costs associated with these and really making them accessible to others to be able to implement. So really proud of the work that we're doing and really the global impact that this can have. This isn't about oil and gas. This is about energy systems and, and removing energy poverty for in fact the globe. Yeah, no, really, really excellent points. Joy, thank you. Um, uh, Brett, did you want to comment on that question? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. I, I mean, I can't comment on on, on low low carbon products because we're, we're we're not going to do that. But I can turn that around and comment on Canada exporting technology, low carbon technology. Right? I mean, that's we 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 employ over a hundred people now, and we're just going to grow, and we're we're going to manufacture in Canada low carbon technology, actual hardware, right? The filter structures we're gonna manufacture here. And that's just a piece of it, right? If we, if we actually demonstrate our projects in Canada too, then all of that know-how that the, all the stakeholders in that project can, can develop can be exported around the world too and, and help. I, I think Canada is in the position to demonstrate and then teach the rest of the world how, we can, how, how, how that we can be a, 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 a economy that's that's based on on oil and gas and and, and other things um, how we can be responsible right right so exporting uh, technology I, I think is 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 key for Canada to do where we can do it no that's great thank you Brett um, well let's see uh, I, I'm just mindful of time again and I I know there's a couple other points we we wanted to touch on um, regarding CCS technologies, and you guys kind of brushed on technologies in your answer, but, um, you know, sort of, this will probably be our final question before the, we might take a couple questions for the audience from Q&A, but I wanted to see if there was some emerging CCS technologies or new uh, ones that might be piloted that y'all uh, might want to talk about that we feel can have a significant role in, in reducing CO2 emissions. I can go and lead off if you wish. I mean, one, yeah, of, sure, the, Thank you. one yeah. of the ones that we're piloting uh, right now together uh, with Synovus and, and Suncor actually on the, uh, on the shell site, on the Quest site, is molten carbonate fuel cells. And they're pretty cool because a lot of the technologies that we've talked about to date are actually from hydrogen plants, but this captures from flue gas. And uh, which is, you know, that's, that's in the too hard pile and uh, which is really important. And uh, it generates electricity um, without a carbon footprint. And it generates flue gas without a carbon footprint and it captures CO2. So think about this, you take 
molten carbonate fuel cells and on a, um, an in situ site and you combine that with probably solvents and voila, you have a net zero in situ site. So um, these these things are are, are the technologies that uh, and you're generating electricity at the same time. Um, so these are the kinds of technologies that we're excited about. Uh, obviously, Svante's as well um, as we as we go forward because they are what allow us to make a difference. And and these are technologies that are that are not applicable just to us as I shared before. They're applicable to anybody. And so look at any, any natural gas um, electricity generation facility. These are solutions for those. Yeah, yeah that's- I, 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 I yeah. can comment on that too, Christina. We, we, yeah, we want to demonstrate the hard to the hard ones to tackle. We want to demonstrate on a fluidized catalytic cracker, for instance, capture C2 from there. We want to demonstrate uh, capturing CO2 from a steam methane reformer, and we want to demonstrate uh, capturing CO2 from a, a, a cement plant in in Alberta, right? Uh, and all in Alberta. It, it, that's what we, you know. The, the targets are there. And, and the infrastructure is there, and that's what we want to demonstrate on a much larger scale. So that's that that's our goal. We 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 want to have a big presence in Alberta, absolutely. And I yeah, think you. just to follow up on the the technology piece, I mean, I see innovation absolutely everywhere along this value chain, and I think in there's two lenses when I think about the sequestration part. Um, this is not new technology. This is very certain technology, but it's about perfecting it. And how do we actually make sure the measurement, monitoring, verification of that is yeah. dialed in, tuned in, holding the value of those offsets? So critically important. And that's work with the regulator, the government. There's also policy innovation and thinking mm -hmm. about the carbon markets. Those are new and those are immature and we're finding Absolutely. out what works, what doesn't, how do the, um, how do the relationships evolve? And, and again, that involves so many people from, from regulators to government, to technology developers, to capture entities, to emitters, to transporters, to sequesters. So all of this has to come together. And then I think at the end of the day, if you've got sequestration entities like Enhanced that are driving down costs, that are finding cost-effective locations for that CO2 to sequester, can you enable more technology development? Can you enable the Svantes to more easily connect in with large emitters to make sure those projects happens? Because those right now are where the costs are. And so if you can get that certainty, if you can get that safety and that confidence in sequestration, how do we actually elevate innovation along you know, energy transition, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's capture, all of these things that come together. So I get really excited when we start talking about tech and innovation um, and seeing our piece in it not as tech, uh, te tech innovation itself, but tech innovation enabling. Absolutely. And just thank you for that. And I love your comments on innovation. It is, it's such an exciting time right now. And as we've said through this whole webinar, Alberta is the one place that has all of the pieces that can be put together readily to make these projects happen. So thank you for echoing that theme. Um, let me go ahead and ask just a couple of questions from the audience before we, we wrap up. We started back from a rate a few minutes late, but I want to try to end close to the time. Um, one of the questions, Ian, I don't know if you're still with us there. One of the questions that came up uh, from the audience was some, um, some folks wanted to better understand um, with regards to Hub 7, um, which is the vote, the one near Edmonton? Um, is there a, is there a prime lead operator that you can mention, or or any or the major players that are are most interested in that hub from OGI's OGCI's perspective? Are you able to discuss that? So just broadly speaking, the, the way that the hub search worked, it wasn't to necessarily define which projects that we were as member companies looking to define and, and work in. It looked at the most cost optimal um, CCS hub. Uh, in the area uh, and therefore it, it ignored who owned the, the facilities etc uh, and so it, basically the the Edmonton hub that we had there's actually three hubs identified around Edmonton because there were so many emitters and such good storage that the way to get it down to the cost effectiveness of, of less than $50 per ton was to basically pull those high purity CO2 sources together and store them locally. Uh, and then, of course, if we were doing that, then we'd have to look potentially for other stores for, for the other emitters that are more expensive. 
Uh, but on the topic of what we're doing for our Edmonton hub that we're looking at, um, basically the member companies of OGCI are discussing internally what the best approach to sort of help catalyze this along uh, in various uh, domains, whether it's uh, like Texas, we're really looking there for just helping get the right policy and regulatory issues if sorted out for Texas. But we don't really need that in, uh, in, in, Alberta, in Alberta. So what is it that we can add here? It's probably more the convening power and bringing the players together that are interested in this, as well as the sort of helping to run sort of seminars a bit like this. We're getting a bit more detail about well, what does the tier system mean for you? What, what does LCF mean for you? What about international trading of credits? How does that work? And how can your company play in that domain? Because our member companies sort of have those specialists within our organizations that a lot of other entities, you know, smaller companies within, within Alberta and Canada may not have. And therefore having that knowledge exchange as well. So we're, we're hopeful. We've been a bit delayed to COVID. I'll put my ha our hands up. That hasn't helped. Uh, but um, certainly we, we hope to sort of start moving forward uh, the OGCI um, actions and, 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 and stuff on the ground in the near future. Great, Ian, thank you for sharing that, um, that level of detail. One last question before we wrap up. Um, Candace, we've had a, a lot of interest in um, what Enhance is doing, and I'm wondering if you're able to talk about the structure of uh, the tax credits and, and how those get allocated um, from the point from when you capture the CO2, maybe back up the value chain. Is that something you're able to share with us? That's a Big question, Christina. Um, okay? and, you know, when we uh, you preface the question with sort of tax credits, and certainly that's something that's under discussion right now um, at the federal government le uh, level is, is in consultation. Um, what we do know more about is the offsets, and I've talked a little bit about those and, and where they accrue with the um, sequestration entity under the EOR the the flagged EOR protocol that exists in the tier system in Alberta today. I'm happy to share some resources and point people in the right direction if they'd like to get in touch. So certainly welcome to do that. Um, but I think the final, maybe what's what's really important is probably just to leave it as it depends. Because mm -hmm. while an offset in its, its you know, and a, and a credit in its um, sort of protocol sense will accrue to the sequestration entity when that molecule is verified as permanently sequestered, the value flows up the chain. And that's going to depend on projects and who's invested and to what degree and how those relationships have been developed. What is the business model? So there's a lot of, of factors and they're going to change between projects. Um, so I, I think what's, what's important to remember is that, you know, there is one molecule, one ton of CO2 has one credit um, and that it, that's being sort of generated at the sequestration and then how that becomes shared will depend on the projects and the partners involved. No, that's fantastic, Candice. And certainly in our follow-up email, we can include some links to resources that you might suggest for people if they want to learn more about how it works. So thank you for that. Definitely. Wow, this panel has been amazing. And I feel like we didn't have enough time because we had so many fantastic topics to cover about collaboration and technology and really the potential and possibilities around Alberta. So I'm sensing we're going to have to have a follow on discussion at some point. So, but thank you, panelists. Really enjoyed your time today hearing about your organizations and your role in the CCS value chain. And um, thank you for being here. So now I'm going to pass it back over thank to you. Jeff Erickson, who um, is going to give us his thoughts and, and close us out for the webinar. Thanks, Jeff. Great, thank you, Christina. And thank you to the participants, not just for this last session, but for all of those that share their knowledge and their experience today. Um, just, I, I know we're running a couple minutes behind, so I'm gonna be as brief as I can be. Uh, first couple of themes that came through that you probably all heard. First, they're in the government uh, province of Alberta, as well as the, the uh, in Canada more generally, there is developed policy, uh, policy and regulatory structure that is there to incentivize investment in CCS. The incentives are in place. Uh, there's knowledge, experience, and expertise throughout the province. There are, are more projects in the pipeline. We heard uh, some teasers here this afternoon. I expect that we'll hear more and more announcements in the very near future. Technology continues to advance, costs continue to come down, and the need and opportunity for CCS continues to grow. One of the things we heard particularly loudly in this last session is 
the essentiality of collaboration to make it all happen. Uh, I was really encouraged by the number of questions that implied an interest in participating in CCS projects. How do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, what's the way for me to do this? Uh, and, and I think, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to answer all those questions today. The best way to do that is just to reach out directly to the speakers that you heard. Uh, and if you need some help with that, contact us and we'll, we'll uh, connect you with them. Um, the slides and recordings uh, and recording of this uh, webinar will be available on our website um, over the next several days. Um, you can find that by going to our website, globalccsinstitute.com, going to our resources page and uh, click on multimedia library. And it should be there at the top of the page. There's some resources that are identified here uh, on this slide uh, that we're quite proud of. I will say that uh, with respect to upcoming webinars, there's another one actually tomorrow is going to focus on the ACORN project in Scotland. And uh, you can register for that. If you haven't had enough today, register for that on our website. Uh, we talked a lot about investing in CCS today. Um, we heard from uh, a lot of different uh, entities, a lot of different organizations, a lot of them actually are of our members. I might be a bit biased, but I think the best investment in CCS is investing in membership in the Institute if you have any interest in that. Uh, Joe, if you go to the next slide, We'll give you some contacts um, uh, within the Institute and you can contact any of us there on the slide. Um, last thing I'll say is uh, that we are uh, looking at having a follow-up of probably a, a, a deeper workshop to this webinar that's in the fall, whether that's in person or uh, remote is still to be determined, but there will be a survey coming out in the next couple of days as a follow-up to this webinar. And we would really appreciate it if you all returned, uh, completed the survey and returned that to us to help us shape the follow-up to this that we're going to have later this year. With that, I'm gonna say thank you for your attention. I know it was a, a long afternoon for many of you. Um, really appreciate your support, your interest in CCS. And if there is anything else that we can do for you here at the Institute, please don't hesitate to reach out. Stay safe, wash your hands um, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.